when Africa gets the issue of its women right, it will have finally gotten its development right. Wow, I couldn't have said those words even much better because for us, that is the epitome and the philosophy of Womanomics Africa. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good morning in some places uh, from a sunny, sunny Johannesburg, my perfect, my favorite time of the year. Uh, some people can't stand the heat, but I would rather have heat than cold and be a prune uh, all day, any, any day. So I'm very excited about the session today. I'm very excited to have you here. Uh, this session for us has been long coming. So as a team at Womanomics Africa, we are so excited that this is happening. My name is Lebu Biko. I will be moderating the session today. I will be hosting you today and I am so excited. I'm joined by my team in the back end, Rihema, Shifiwa and our technical team who will be supporting us today. And I am here as your host, but also as the co-founder of Womanomics Africa, an organization that is founded and whose principles are really around saying, how do we support women to take their meaningful place in the economy? And for us, meaningful place means money in the pocket, uh, in the economies of the continent, focusing primarily on the opportunities that are available around intra-Africa trade. I'm welcoming you to our second session of the Africa of the AFCTA series for entrepreneurs. We had our first session uh, back in August where we just introduced what we were trying to do. And today we begin with the first session that is really around tackling some of the content we want to unpack for you over the next couple of months. And so as we talk about intra-Africa trade as an organization, and as we try and focus that women are actually in their rightful place and are participating meaningfully in those spaces as an organization, we, together with our partners, have tried to focus on making sure that we do three primary things. The first is around connecting women to information and insights on the opportunities and the key considerations that they need to have top of mind as they want to move their businesses beyond one country and across the continent. The way we do this, we deliver this through workshops, through training, through boot camps like we have today, through conferences and even through research. We also focus ourselves on connecting them through to ecosystem partners that are able to support their endeavors, right? There's nothing like knowing that there's an opportunity that exists in a particular industry that you're operating in, 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 in a particular country that you would like to participate in and not having the support to be able to allow you to, to leverage on that opportunity. And so we focus on connecting them to ecosystem partners with a particular focus on access to markets, which is trying to focus on making sure that they, they have access to robust value chains and of course, access to capital, knowing that that's a big, big issue for women. And then thirdly, we focus on connecting them to skills and capacity. And we do that primarily through scale up programs that we run, strategy coaching, leadership development, as well as facilitation. So we are excited that we are here today with all of you and together with our speakers on the first part of that connecting, which is really around giving you insights and information and unpacking what the key considerations are for you as a businesswoman and a business owner wanting to either start trading beyond your borders or are currently having operations that you want to expand. Our plan is to have this series over a number of episodes because we appreciate that this topic on the AFCFTA itself, but also just the topic of trade is such a big topic. And we're going to also be guided by you and what feedback we get from you around what are the things you want us to deep dive into. Hence, it is a series because we know that we're gonna to have to unpack it over a number of episodes. So in some of the upcoming episodes that we know we're going to have, we'll be unpacking issues related to law, to IP, to funding, to tax, and then also diving deeply into specific opportunities where you can participate in by country, and by industry. I'm also so, so excited to welcome you to our campus. Some of you have already been here before. Uh, we were, we were, we were um, fortunate to have had you and women as part of our partner on this campus uh, uh, starting from June uh, up until recently as we were hosting some of the generation equality events. So some of you have come in from there, but we also know from the RSVPs for this particular event that we have quite a few new people. So we're excited about the space that we have created, this wonderful campus as a channel, not only to host events and training sessions such as we have today, but also to use it as a space where we can facilitate that women entrepreneurs can engage with one another, with key ecosystem partners, and also the opportunity for them to showcase their businesses to those who might be potential partners or clients. So I just want to tell you quickly how you can navigate. So if you look to the left side of your screen, so the left-hand side of your screen, you will see there are a number of tabs. 
And <laughs> currently you're in the tab that says sessions, which is where this workshop is right now. It's also our hope that you will stay here for the duration of the session. Engagement in this particular session is via a chat. So if you have any questions, any comments, on the right-hand side of the screen, you will see a space where you can post some of your comments and your questions, and we will pick them up there. And we're looking forward to having many of those. Also, when you look on the left-hand side of the tab, you'll see that there is a lobby. So in this lobby, like in any other physical space in the lobby, it's the place where you see who's actually here, right? Where you can see what is happening, who's going, who's coming. And once you're there, you're able to see, if you look at the person's name, you'll see there's a green dot flashing next to their name and their picture. If you click on that name, you'll be able to see all their contact details. We do encourage people, you will know when you created your profile for this particular uh, platform. We asked a whole lot of information. It felt like we were drawing blood at some point in time, but it was really because this platform is around uh, 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 making sure that we optimize engagement. We wanted more than just your email address and your name and your surname. We wanted your name, your surname, your company, your your your, your title, if you've got any social media uh, uh, tags that we can use so that if people want to connect and connect with you and engage with you, they have all that information. So if you click on somebody's name, you'll be able to see all their contact information. You can either engage with them using that contact information, or you can even engage with them directly on the platform where you can initiate a chat. We also have some networking rooms that we have over there. So there's quite a few of them that we've got. And if at some point, hopefully at the end of the session, once again, you want to go in there and see who's in there, you can connect with other businesswomen or even some of our, of our experts here. So I'm hoping that you can use this platform very fully. And then finally, what we do have is an exhibition area. And in this exhibition area, where, as I said, up until recently, it was occupied by UN Women and some of their business organizations. We have a few entrepreneurs and businesses that have booths in there. And in those booths, if you go in, you'll see that they've uploaded some of their information, some documents that you can download. Some of them have videos that they've uploaded there, uh, some links that you can get into. And you can also begin to uh, uh, um, set up some, some uh, appointments with them directly by emailing them and contacting them. So we will be continuously updating this over the duration of the series and beyond as we are part of this of this campus if you'd like to find out how you can also exhibit so that you can expose your business to really a borderless community because that's what digital has allowed us to do please do send us an email at mail at womanomics.net and we will be able to direct you in terms of how how you can participate to that so and as before we went to our session i'm just going to ask the team now just to give us a very very quick video of the campus. Uh, this campus video shows you the other side of this campus that we have. So we have it in 2D, which is where all of you currently are now as a web-based platform. And we also have it in a very exciting 3D platform. So you can actually create your own avatar. I love it because I can change shoes every now and then when I'm there. So sometimes I've got red shoes, sometimes I've got black shoes. So I love it. Uh, and we have that there and it will show you some of the functionality that 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 uh, you can use once you become a community member of the campus. Team, if you can just cue in that video for us, please.
So together with our partners at VirtueWorks, we have uh, created this, uh, what is it that Mark Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg calls it, this metaverse, uh, in a place where the physical and the digital world come together. And just like everybody else, we were thrust into the digital space um, very fast. But I know that with my business partner, Rehema, one of the things we always knew would be very important in trade and in facilitating trade, particularly on the continent, would be this aspect of, of, of digital. And so we're excited that we have this. We are working on making sure that we're creating a vibrant ecosystem uh, of women entrepreneurs, but also of the partners that are supportive of women entrepreneurs at a meso, at a micro, at a macro level, just to make sure that women are not left behind as this continent looks to making sure that it increases it's 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 intra-africa trade efforts so on to the session for today and why we are actually gathered here today and and my 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 oprah moment um the session for today is really around trade and and why is it that we've picked on this topic of trade and even as we unpack one of the the key policies for the continent which is this africa continental free trade According to the World Bank's report that was released in 2020 on women and trade, the report states that trade has a huge, huge potential to dramatically improve women's lives, to expand their role in the economy, to decrease inequality, and to expand women's access to skills and education, right? All the things that we know are key and are big issues that women have limitations to in terms of advancing their own economic participation. In terms of this ex access and in terms of this expansion of, of an improvement of life, this is both as employees, as organizations themselves uh, look to, to increase their own uh, trade efforts, as well as women, as women entrepreneurs and business owners themselves. The changing global economy, as we've seen it, is also offering new opportunities for women through modern services. I think the trend that they talk about in this particular report is called servicification. So as service, as the need for services increases, we're seeing that there's a great opportunity for that to, 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 to be seen and facilitated through, through intra-Africa trade and through global trade. As global value chains is one of the key trends that we're seeing around as more companies become more integrated into these value chains. And we know, for instance, why that is important, because we've seen now, particularly with COVID and how women were the worst impacted around uh, this pandemic from an economic point, point of view. And that's primarily because they were not part of robust value chains and were on the periphery and often in industries that were, were not be able to be saved around, around this pandemic and suffer, suffered the most. And so we know that it's about services, it's about global value chains, and also the trend around the digital technology and new online platforms that are creating these great opportunities for women to bypass traditional trade barriers and even expand their entrepreneurial skills. Africa, particularly, as we know, offers promising opportunities for growth, despite even this COVID pandemic, opportunities for growth supported by development and investment. Even as the GDP for Sub-Saharan Africa has contracted in 2020, the IMF is, is expecting regional GDP to rebound by over 3% in 2021 and by close to 4% in 2022, testifying to the underlying economic vibrancy that exists in this region. On the 1st of January this year, trading um, among state parties under this African, Africa continental free trade area began, aimed at boosting intra-Africa trade. We know that intra-Africa trade on this continent is lower than many other continents on, 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 on Earth here. The agreement creates one of the world's largest free trade area by number of countries and population, with 1.2 billion people covered across all of the countries on the continent, representing a combined GDP of 3.4 trillion, which is set to grow to over 6 trillion over the next 10 years. So at a time when the continent's economies have been hardest hit by this pandem pandemic, the AFCFTA holds economic promise. It not, not only has the potential to stimulate Africa's COVID-19 recovery, it has the potential to reshape the continent and, and globalization at large. I think it has been actually been touted as the stimulus package uh, for, for our continent. The World Bank expects that this agreement will lift about six, 68 million people out of poverty and make Africa even more competitive as an economic bloc. The pandemic has underpinned the need to reevaluate global value chains with multinationals, considering reshoring and nearshoring operations. In this context, the AFCTA has the potential 
to not only reduce the region's exposure to global interruptions, disruptions and interruptions, but boost local competition and productivity and promote food security. Women across Africa, we know, make less money and remain underrepresented in key economic spheres. I read a report the other day that said that they, they make, in terms of money in their pocket, particularly when women entrepreneurs, close to about 35% uh, less than men. Women's economic participation and equal participation in, in international trade is critical to promoting economic growth, enhancing productivity, increasing international competitiveness, and reducing poverty. Women's economic empowerment is crucial to unlocking the full potential of this free trade area and achieving the SDGs, which are the Sustainable Development Goals. So this afternoon, we are joined by phenomenal experts on the topic of the Africa continental free trade area to help us understand and unpack how women's participation in trade and in this particular policy could look like. As I said, this conversation is a first in what we are envisaging to be a series of engagements and conversations uh, that will allow us to make sure that women are not left behind. Today's conversation, we are joined by Trudy Hartzenberg from Trailer, Claudia Furiel from the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition, as well as Marie Providence Mungangu from the AFCTA Secretariat in Accra. So I've said a whole spiel around why we're here and about this trade, this trade policy, but the experts are here and I'd like to hand over to them. So I'd like to kick off this session by inviting Trudy to come on board and just a quick read of Trudy's bio. Trudy Hartzenberg is the Economic Director of Trade Law Center, which is TRELEC as we know it. She is responsible for the development of TRELEC strategy, resource mobilization and engagement with African governments, regional, continental and inter international organizations. She currently serves on the World Trade Organization's Chair Advisory Committee and is member of the Committee for the Development Policy of the United Nations Economic and Social Council. She supports women's economic empowerment, which is awesome, focusing on women traders in national and regional business associations, and also helps heads up She Governs Trade, an empowerment program for young women trade policymakers. Her research ideas include international trade, competition policy, industrial development, and Africa's integration agenda. She has special interest in capacity building. She designs and delivers academic and tailored uh, short courses a broad range of, of trade related topics, investment competition, policy and industrial industrialization. Trudy, I'd like you to come on board, please. Trudy is going to provide us with a perspective of the AFCTA, where we are on it currently, what the considerations are in trade protocols and the practical, what I love about it is a practical reality check on actually what it means to trade on the continent and some of the facilitation uh, uh, issues that we might have as we do so. Thank you, Trudy, for me here. Good afternoon, and I'm handing over to you. Lebo, thank you so much for that very kind introduction, but also for walking us through your amazing platform. I can't wait to get into the lobby, and um, I'll soon be sending some specs for my avatar to join you on that very nice so sofa for a good trade discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, colleagues. It's a great pleasure to have you here. And I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen, very specifically, because women in trade, colleagues, is a concern not only for women, it's a concern for all of us. It's my great pleasure this afternoon to share with you a brief update on the African continental free trade area and also to explore some of the opportunities for women specifically in the AFCFDA. I think it's fair to say that without women in the multiplicity of roles that we play in economy and society, the AFCFDA will not succeed. So we are integral to making the African continental free trade area work for Africa's sustainable development. Colleagues, the AFCFDA is an essential and very ambitious initiative and we should not underestimate the work it will require from all of us to realize the enormous potential to which Lebo has already referred. A trade agreement, extremely important, but it holds a collection of potential which may not necessarily be realized unless we work collectively 
not only on implementing the agreement, but also on the fundamental requirements for assisting us to take advantage of that opportunity that is offered. And that is particularly true as we take a look at the opportunities for women in the AFCFDA. The bottom line, colleagues, is that integration makes sense for Africa. We are a fragmented continent. We are also a continent that is home to 33 least developed countries of the 46 in the world. Many are also landlocked. In fact, 16 of them are also landlocked. This poses very specific challenges for us to promote and take advantage of the intra-Africa trade opportunities. But very important, we must keep in mind that the African continental free trade area has been crafted by very practical, realistic architects. And they have recognized that the AFCFDA is not only about trade amongst ourselves, but for changing the way we trade with our global trade partners. The reality is, colleagues, that we are still trading predominantly commodities, mining and agricultural commodities with the rest of the world without adding very much value on home turf, so to speak. So this is extremely important to keep in mind. Very important to keep in mind, although there's often a lot of focus in an FDA negotiating agenda on tariffs rules of origin and some technical market access issues. The AFCFDA is about much more than that. And therefore, we have to look at the whole of this compact of legal instruments that constitutes the AFCFDA, recognizing also that the architects and our state parties that have signed and ratified the agreement have left open the opportunity to negotiate new legal instruments as may be required. And that's so important with a dynamic approach to the AFCFDA, responding to new and different challenges in a fast changing digital 21st century economy. But what about the AFCFDA and women specifically? And I'm going to address some of the issues specifically that impact women entrepreneurs, not only women traders, colleagues, women investors, women innovators, women workers. So the role of women across the very broad spectrum is relevant to a comprehensive look at the impact, the opportunities, the implications of the AFCFDA for women. But we'll start off with a little bit of an update on where we stand with the negotiations, the implementation processes, and the very important question, when do we start trading? Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, I don't want to get bogged down with legal issues, but this is just a very important overview of the architecture of this legal compact. And I'm using that term because, of course, there are a number of different legal instruments that comprise the African continental free trade area. Right at the top, <clears throat> excuse me, we have the agreement establishing the AFCFDA. This is akin to an umbrella agreement, if you like. And then we have protocols specifically on trade in goods, one on trade in services, a protocol on dispute settlement. They are in phase one of the negotiations. You will also see there are annexes to these protocols. And this is where the fine print is that we have to comply with, but also colleagues where the opportunities lie. So a very important part of taking advantage of the AFCFDA opportunities is reading and studying the details of these annexes. 
phase two of the AFCFTA negotiations, colleagues, focuses on investment, competition policy, intellectual property rights. And I'm going to come back to each one of those in turn. These are often termed more new generation issues, but they're absolutely critical for women, traders, entrepreneurs, innovators, and women workers. Phase three, here we see the addition of what we might call a new agenda in the digital economy space, and that is the protocol on e-commerce. Now, we haven't started negotiate that, negotiating that one yet, but that means we've got an opportunity to influence the agenda. And we're going to pause a little bit today in the discussion on digital trade and digital trade opportunities. Very importantly, we will also be negotiating a protocol on women, youth, and SME development. Again, these agendas are not yet decided. That window of opportunity needs to be effectively utilized by all of us so that we influence the agenda setting process even before the negotiations start. An update, colleagues, of where we stand on some technical issues, how many countries have ratified the agreement, and where are the negotiating processes currently focused? And this is, is an infographic, colleagues, which comes from the Trelloc website. We regularly update this as we get information from our negotiators, from the AFC, FDA Secretariat, and the African Union Commission, which are all playing such an important role in making the AFCFTA a, real, a reality. In terms of ratifications, and I'll say a little bit about that, usually what happens when an agreement is negotiated, the negotiating parties sign off to signal that they are comfortable with the concessions that they've had to make and what has been achieved in the negotiating process. Following that, there is a process leading to ratification. In most of our countries, that means that the executive branch of government in South Africa, that's the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition, takes this agreement to Parliament and asks Parliament for approval of the signature and ratification. Once Parliament has approved that, then we get to an international part of the process. And that is where an instrument of ratification, usually just a one page document, which says that the sovereign state, particular country, agrees to be bound by the terms and conditions of the agreement. Without that, a country is not bound by the agreement. And that takes place in the case of the AFCFDA in Addis Ababa where the chair of the African Union Commission is the depository. So the chair collects all the instruments of ratification and we know what the status is. So we're color coding um, the countries that have signed. And you'll note that there is one Eritrea that is not yet signed, one member of the African Union. But the ones in the dark pink are the ones that have actually ratified the agreement. Very important, Tanzania, in the news not so long ago, colleagues, that they had received parliamentary approval. Now the next step is to go to Addis Ababa with the instrument of ratification. Within various customs union configurations, quite interesting, not all the member states with the customs unions have necessarily already ratified the agreement. So just to take a couple of examples here in EAC Tanzania, still waiting for that deposit of the instrument of ratification. ECOWAS, Benin, Benigisau, um, Guinea-Bissau, and Liberia have not yet ratified. And in the case of the Southern African Customs Union, Botswana is still to ratify the agreement. Question is, when can we trade under the AFCFDA? And colleagues, this is quite important because, of course, we launched trade on the 1st of January this year. But our negotiations on key elements of this agreement were not complete. Tariffs and rules of origin, which are the minimum requirements for a free trade area, are still under negotiation. You may well ask, but why don't we actually make progress more quickly? 
these are very, very sensitive issues because tariffs generate revenue for government. And some particularly least developed countries, colleagues, are quite dependent on tariff revenue. But increasingly more important, tariffs are a way of protecting the domestic industry. And we all want to industrialize and develop our productive capacity and create jobs. So tariffs are a sensitive matter. And tariffs are partnered by rules of origin because the rules of origin determine which goods will be able to be traded under the lower tariffs. So rules of origin are a gateway to lower tariffs. So they're also rather sensitive because they can also be used to protect the domestic industry from import competition. Sector commitments for trade and services. We have five priority services sectors, finance, financial services, communication, transport, tourism, and professional services. We're still negotiating specific commitments there. And it's possible to add more services sectors to, to that list. For example, healthcare, education, distribution services are all really important. And many of them have become more significant during COVID. So we fully expect that that list will grow. And then implementation has to take place. So right now, although we can't yet trade under the AFCFDA, of course, you and I know very well that intra-Africa trade continues, although not at the level we would like to see. But there is definitely cross-border trade. And it takes place under the rules of the existing regional economic community. So trade within SADC, say, from Malawi to Zambia would probably be under the rules of SADC, could also be under the rules of Kamesa because they both belong to those two regional economic communities. And if it's not trade under a REC, FTA or customs union, then the rules of the World Trade Organization apply if the members are members of the WTO. So for example, if South Africa trades with Nigeria, South Africa belonged to SACU. SACU does not have a free trade agreement with ECOWAS and Nigeria. So we trade under the tariff of the WTO that we agreed there. Just a reminder, colleagues, very quickly that, of course, the regional economic communities will continue to exist. The RECs are so important as part of our overall integration process and agenda. And they cover much more than trade. In fact, some of them actually don't have free trade areas yet, but they have very important programs, sometimes related to shared water courses. Water, very scarce resource in many sub-regions of the continent, but they also cover education, peace and security, and many, many issues which are complementary and very important to the success of any trade agenda. So these are the eight that are recognized by the African Union. So these are noted, but of course there are others. And we're sitting in South Africa at the moment. One of those other regional economic communities is of course SACU. So we have a number of regional economic communities with very comprehensive and very, very important integration agendas. They will not disappear but they will exist side by side. So the question is, where will the added value come from the AFCFT? And let's, let's say I'm sitting in Cape Town this afternoon, colleagues. So um, I'm in South Africa and South Africa belongs to SACU. That's Namibia, Botswana, Lesotho, Eswatini and South Africa. And it also belongs to SADC, the broader group that is shaded here. But in the gray region, we don't have any preferential trade agreements. So those are the new market opportunities that will open for us from South Africa or Namibia or Botswana or Malawi, for example. So that's quite important to keep in mind. I'm going to go through this rather quickly, colleagues, the phase one negotiations. And this is very much focused on trade and goods. Keep in mind that each member state of the African Union or the members of a customs union collectively would make a tariff offer. 
So we put on the table our first, our opening bid, so to speak, in the negotiations. And then we negotiate with our partners to come to the final agreed tariff concessions. 30th of June was an important deadline. And some 42 countries, we understand, have actually made tariff offers. So not everybody has yet put it an offer on the table that is compliant with the modalities for the negotiations. Some rules of origin, and I think this is quite important to keep in mind, are still being negotiated as well. And I'll say a little bit about that in a minute. These, just as a reminder, colleagues, are the modalities. We are aiming really high. We want to liberalize trade for 90% of tariff lines. And over a five-year period for the non-least developed countries, 10 years for LDCs, 7% of tariff lines may be designated sensitive. So we can liberalize them over a longer period of time. And 3% of tariff lines we can exclude. So those are really sensitive products that are important, say, for food security, national security, fiscal revenue, <coughs> excuse me, and so on. Focusing very, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> focusing very quickly on the rules of origin. Colleagues, the rules of origin, as I've mentioned, they are so important. They are the requirements that have to be met if a product is going to be a product of Nigeria or of South Africa or Kenya, for example. And there are various rules for agricultural products very often the rule is that they must be wholly obtained. So if it's live animals we're trading, they must be born and raised within a particular state party to qualify as a product of that country. When it comes to fisheries products, for example, and other products of the sea, and that's important to stress other products of the sea. There are a lot of opportunities or rivers or lakes. So important to keep that in mind, they must be wholly obtained. For industrial products, we usually look at value addition. How much value do we add? And as I mentioned right at the beginning, of course, we are still exporting a lot of commodities which are going to be processed elsewhere, not on the continent. We want to encourage that value addition, that industrialization on the continent. So this is really important that the rules of origin focus on those issues. About 13% of tariff lines are not yet agreed. And these are products where a number of African countries have got an interest. They include automotive products, vehicles, components, catalytic converters, you name it, all of that, clothing and textiles. So many African countries actually have garment industries that they want to further develop so we can understand that that will be sensitive. Edible oils, sugar, fish, particularly dried snook in South Africa, we know this fish really well, but it's also of interest to countries like Mauritius that want to dry and process that fish, but they may not have sufficient within their economic waters surrounding the island. So they want to be able to import and add value domestically and then export it. Some dairy products, buttermilk and cheese, are also still to get their rules of origin. So very important that we look at these technicalities. I've mentioned, and I'm going to skip through this, the specific commitments for trade and services. And here, just to confirm, are those priorities, services sectors. But I do want to emphasize the last point on this slide. Colleagues, trade and services offer significant opportunities for women entrepreneurs. And we already see in the protocol on trade and services, there is a provision which requires that the state parties support women services providers specifically. We don't know exactly what that will mean yet, but very important key. Keep in mind that the services sectors, as Lebo has mentioned, are important in the servicification of production, whether it's agriculture or industry, or in the services sectors themselves. We often find focus on the role of women in tourism, but women are act active in so many other sectors. And all of the services sectors should be where we are focusing, financial services, communication, transport, 
and all the other services offer significant opportunities for women. Let's take that up. Very briefly, colleagues, as I mentioned, I would say something about investment competition and intellectual property rights. This is critical for women entrepreneurs. And let's focus here in the interest of time on IPR, intellectual property rights. Women innovators, product and process developers need to protect their intellectual property right, rights. The value of their business initiatives lies in the areas of design, scientific discovery, development of processes, which are extremely important, that needs to be protected. Because as soon as you're exporting products or services across borders, if that intellectual property is not protected, you're leaving yourself open to someone else taking up that opportunity, copying your design, for example, and you will have nowhere to go to enforce your rights, your intellectual property rights. Keep in mind also that intellectual property rights cover services, services trademarks, for example. So it's not only goods that are important when we talk about intellectual property, but we've got to think of the services sectors as well. Now, some countries at this stage don't have some of the services trademarks. And that is something that Trellick discovered when we were applying for trademark protection for our intellectual property. We discovered some countries don't have services trademarks. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done at national level. Keep in mind also that there are existing regional arrangements for intellectual property right cooperation. So in Eastern Southern Africa, the African Regional Intellectual Property Organization headquartered in Zimbabwe is really important, but not all of the countries in East and Southern Africa belong. For example, South Africa doesn't. Now, the aim of the regional organizations, for example, is that instead of applying to protect your intellectual property in each one of those member states, you make one application which covers all of the member states. But since there are some gaps in membership, you will still have to apply specifically in this case to South Africa. So this is the kind of information, colleagues, that we really need to be gathering and sharing among women entrepreneurs so that we are prepared when trade starts under the AFCFTA. And even, even now, it's so, so important to develop that knowledge and take advantage of these legal instruments. Phase three negotiations, e-commerce, digital trade. This I'm going to say a little bit more about in terms of opportunities. Competition policy and investment, let me pause just for a few seconds here. We know that a draft of the investment protocol is being prepared currently. I'm really hoping that investment facilitation will be high on that agenda because colleagues, investment facilitation deals with the nitty gritty of actually establishing a commercial presence in a foreign jurisdiction, opening a company in a country outside your own, making the applications, dealing with the red tape, the paperwork, getting access to incentives that you may not know about if these are not publicly available, easily publicly available. So the protocol on investment, very important, not only for cross-border trade, but for cross-border value chain engagement, for establishing your business, making a commercial presence a reality in another country. Competition policy. These are the checks and balances against unfair trade practices. And very often, SMEs, women-owned businesses, are vulnerable to anti-competitive practices. We need recourse to address those issues, colleagues. That's very, very important too to keep in mind. Trade facilitation. This is so important. The protocol on trade and goods includes four annexes that deal with trade facilitation. It enjoys high priority in the AFCFDA. We know that border governance issues are particularly important for women, for women traders. We know from the data 
of non-tariff barrier notification portals, for example, that women are more likely to be impacted by NTBs than men. The complaints registered on those portals are mostly by men. In fact, women are notable by their absence when it comes to looking at the profile of who is notifying non-tariff barriers. That needs to change. Lack of facilities for women at border posts, and I can go on and on. Women are far more susceptible to corruption, harassment, including sexual harassment at border posts, colleagues. That is what the AFCFDA, the Border Governance Improvement Trade Facilitation Agenda, needs to address. And it should include, for example, digitization, taking compliance to a large extent away from the border, having facilities for women, Having women customs officers, if there are searches being done, for example, where are the women who should be doing that for other women? Now, the digital trade opportunities. Colleagues, these are so important. If you and your business have a digital presence, whether it's a website, whether you're on Tumblr or Insta, you name it, you immediately have access, potential access to a market beyond your home market. In other words, you are immediately in a trade, a cross-border trade space. But getting access to those opportunities will also require other prerequisites. For example, cross-border payments. Now, there are complementary initiatives being development, developed that are really important here. But... The goods, even on an e-commerce platform, colleagues, still have to cross a border. So we do not avoid the traditional challenges of cross-border trade, of having goods stuck at a border post. And that particularly challenging when we're dealing with agribusiness and agri-process products. So I want to say a little bit about social media marketing and digital trade. Which of these platforms are you using? in your business. And I hope it's not just one or two, but it is a list of all of these. And of course, there are more. This is a selection of social media platforms that we can see and can find within the broader digital marketing space. Colleagues, key trends in digital marketing, and this is so important, Cross-border trade is not automatic. It doesn't happen on its own. You have to find a buyer, an agent, a customer who will buy your good or your service. You will have to look at freight forwarding, transport, storage facilities, and so on. How do we do that? So digital marketing becomes extremely important, and these from some of the influences that I follow, are some of the important trends in 2021. Digital marketing, particularly live video, live streaming. So YouTube, Vimeo, and, and other platforms, extremely important. Getting your business to the attention of your potential market. Audio content. This is so interesting. Podcasts are not over by a long way. For example, Twitter now permits audio content distribution as well. Use multiple platforms, colleagues. Really, really important. Very important for a business is user-generated content. So this is, what do your customers say about you? It's often word of mouth, but it's often much more relatable and real than some advertising campaign that may have been generated by somebody who does not really understand your business. So, and it's cheaper. But we've got to be careful about protection of personal information. So we've got to look at those, those requirements. Brand activism. Colleagues, are you in the agribusiness space, for example? We're watching what's happening at COP26. It's a reality. We have to green production, transform our production and trade processes. Use your marketing to message about your activism. 
your advocacy, social responsibility, extremely important. Branded content is obviously very important as well. And I want to say a little bit about green economy developments. Consumers, more and more colleagues, are aware. In the first instance, we may say they want value because we all face a budget constraint. That's the reality. But more and more consumers are concerned. They are informed. They want to know. They want to know your business story. They want to know your contribution to social responsibility, to the environment. So this becomes so important when we take a look at the scope of digital marketing. They want to know about your carbon footprint, health impacts. And this is where issues such as packaging and labeling become really important. For packaging, they're asking, why do I have to take responsibility for recycling the packaging? Why is this product in double packaging? So they want to know about reusability, recyclability, and eventually compost, compostability of, of packaging as well. Labeling, extremely important. They want product information. They want use information. They want impact information. They want to know your story. So labeling is not only an issue of compliance with certain requirements in the AFC FDA, but it's also a marketing opportunity. And I'll show you how we can work on that a little bit later. But colleagues, the SPS and TBT annexes of the AFC FDA deal with these issues, the packaging, labeling, all of these digital marketing opportunities have at the end of the day legal instruments which are particularly relevant study those what do we need to do in terms of packaging and labeling our products e-commerce opportunities here obviously an e-commerce platform could simply be a website but it could be a fully fledged e-commerce e platform that you develop or a platform on which you market your products. The terms and conditions of the latter, colleagues, we've got to study very carefully. What does it cost for my goods to be on, whether it be Mall of Africa, Jumia, Sokuku, any one of the platforms available on the African continent? What are the terms and conditions? What does it cost me? Which payment platform is used and linked to that? What happens to the data? that my customers are generating for that platform. Do I get access to that? These are the questions you and I should be asking. But again, here, linking and the use, for example, of QR codes, so quick response codes, this is a way to market your product. You can provide a lot of background information, but also market your business, develop your profile using Simple QR code, very easy to generate those yourself. So, and have access to your multiple platforms that you're using. This is so important. So colleagues, I'm going to end off with just a couple of minutes, Lebo, I'm sorry for taking so long. I want to say a little bit very briefly about institutional arrangements of the AFC FDA, because you and I need to know which door to knock on digitally or actually physically when we want information, when we want to take a look at compliance issues, we want to understand the commitments of the country to which we're exporting. And the AFC FDA Secretary, and I'm so pleased we have Marie with us, um, to share with us some of the developments from, from Accra is really important because, for example, colleagues, the state parties have to notify how they are implementing commitments to the Secretariat. So this will be where there is a collection of knowledge, experience, information, which is really important for you and I to take advantage of the AFC FDA. There are also many other um, institutions, the Council of Ministers, that's the Council of Trade Ministers, Committee of Senior Trade Officials. At the moment, both are chaired by South Africa. Other committees on NTBs, on SPS, and so many other subcommittees. 
There's also a dispute settlement body. The rules of procedure for that have now been adopted towards the end of September. And then there's the summit. And that, of course, is really important because that's where our heads of state give guidance, they take stock and make important decisions to unlock any challenges that we might have. Finally, level. There are so many complementary initiatives, colleagues, and this is so important because it's not only the agreement that matters, but it's these complementary initiatives. I'm hoping to meet some of you at the Intra-Africa Trade Fair next week in Durban. This is not only a business connector opportunity, but also for you to get information about the AFCFDA. It will be a hybrid event, so there will be opportunity, even if you're not traveling to Durban, to be able to take advantage of the developments. But also, there are virtual platforms to connect with other businesses. Explore that website, colleagues. Register so that you're part of the opportunities that can come from the IATF. This, at the top left-hand corner, is the portal for notification of non-tariff barriers. Please register. It's so important. You cannot notify a non-tariff barrier. For example, if a customs officer does not accept your rules of origin or your SPS certificate, where do you go to complain? And one of the ways to complain is to log on to this website and write your story because it will be followed up. But you have to be registered. Now, there are some challenges around connectivity, data access, and so on that, that are plaguing um, facilities such as this. But we're going to find ways around that to assure energy security across the continent because so many opportunities for renewables becoming available now. So you and I, as energy consumers in a previous era, can now become energy producers. So we've got to change that on the continent to assure energy security. The African Trade Observatory, a lot of data about the AOCFDA information, but also hopefully trade leads. So if I'm producing a product, how do I find a buyer? And there are many, many portals being developed to provide those business connections to facilitate trade. So they are complementary to the trade facilitation agenda, to your digital marketing. So important to keep in mind. Africsim Bank, Africa's premier export-import bank, very important in trade finance provision, and they are developing finance instruments and products specifically for women, so look out for those. But they are also rolling out a pan-African payment and settlement system to facilitate cross-border payments in national currencies. So we don't run the forex risk of having to go into an international currency and then back into a national currency. Lebu, I'm going to stop there. Extremely interesting developments for us and um, certainly look forward to, to discussion and questions and contributions on how we take advantage of the AFCFDA. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Trudy. Um, I always said that when we when we started these sessions and, and, and the reason for part of these sessions was really to help what we call like land the helicopter, right? So we've had this, this free trade area. It's, you know, this policy, it's wonderful. There's a lot of hype, a lot of excitement, but I think often things get left at the policy level and those uh, organizations that must, must really make trade happen on the continent are actually the businesses and often they are not the ones who understand what needs to happen. So thank you so much for such a, a diverse view of what is happening on, 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 on this particular policy, right from where we are, what's happening, what is some of the progress, what are some of the challenges, but also right down to some of the practicalities of actually trading on the continent, right down to marketing, right? I, I would have never thought about you know, putting that as, as a topic in this particular discussion, but it's really important. And what I love about that is almost just reminding people to also leverage what is already existing, the things that they do have, the tools that they have. So even though we've got this trade policy, uh, it's almost saying it's an addition to what we already have and how do we use what we already have to enhance what we're trying to do. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. We do have a few questions which I want I want to go through. Uh, if you can put your camera on, that would be awesome. Uh, so we can go through them. But I think one of the questions 
questions that I'm finding quite interesting that has come up is that, you know, how is the rest of the world uh, uh, viewing this this um, uh, free trade area? You know, are they excited about it? Are there any issues of, of insecurity and uncertainty around it uh, in terms of the rest of the world? And actually, really, are African countries on this continent better off trading with each other or actually some of the agreements that they have with the rest of the world, you know, are better off? What, where are we with all of that? What are your views? Thanks so much, Lebo, for that. This is critical. And um, I think we recognize that the AFCFDA is not an inward-looking agreement. It recognizes that there are extremely important relationships with global partners. Yes, we want to change the way that we are trading, not just to be primarily commodity exporters. So extremely important to keep that in mind. But very important, the AFCFDA has generated interest from the global community, investors, traders, and from a women economic empowerment perspective from the diaspora, extremely important. So what we can expect is that foreign direct investment is going to come on the back of the AFCFDA opportunities. Because if you look, for example, at an investor, say, coming from Japan, and they mm. establish commercial presence in Kenya, and mm. Kenya is a state party, they've ratified the agreement, then that Japanese-owned company now established in Kenya will take advantage of all the AFCFDA opportunities. Mm. Now, so there's a, there's a two-sided story here, right. because on the one hand, that investment is necessary for us. The modality of the investment will matter. Are they forming a joint venture with, with a local partner? That would be really, really important. But the foreign direct investment can contribute, for example, to expanding and diversifying our productive capacity. So we've got to look at that, but it may also bring increased competition in our domestic markets. So we've really got to look at the two sides. So the modality of investment, in other words, not only what is in terms of the sector it moves into and exactly how that investment will play out, but we have to take a look at domestic policy and regulation around investment. In other words, in certain sectors, some of our countries may actually have guidelines, rules, which say that this sector, if you invest as a foreign investor here, you have to do it in terms of a joint venture. And that is an area that we've got to look at in the services negotiations, for example, because those are some of the specific commitments and the reservations which we will note. So we say this subsector, say in logistics, we really want to develop local businesses. So yeah. foreign investors, you're welcome you've got to do it in terms of, for example, a joint venture. So domestic regulation becomes really important when we're looking at leveraging foreign direct investment. So the global community, I think, really interesting watching and waiting. So the AFCFT has generated interest way beyond the continent. And it's not only investors, but also traders, because they start seeing opportunities in the growing market because as the AFCFDA generates economic growth and development incomes are going to rise there's more purchasing power there's a bigger market to become part of so it is something that we've got to study very carefully and that means as you point out Lebo that the agreements that we've got with our global partners become extremely important so for example, after Brexit, the UK has knocked on our doors for um, economic partnership agreements and other countries are starting to show interest in concluding FDAs. What about the future of AGOA? What will the US want after 2025? We don't know yet. But then there are other countries which really are not so concerned about trade agreements. So, for example, China. China's got an FDA with Mauritius, but not other countries. But yeah. China signs very specific trade promotion and facilitation MOUs usually with countries. So, for example, South Africa has one that focuses on apples. Yeah. Because apples are really, really important in terms of the regulatory issues around SPS. 
sanitary, yeah. phytosanitary, human, animal, plant health issues and the environment. So they're concerned about residues of pesticides we may use. And so they put emphasis on the labeling of a product such as that. So we start to see that, that our global partners follow different pathways in terms of engaging with us to foster trade, to take advantage of the opportunities of the products and the services that we provide, but equally the market opportunities we, we offer them. Thanks, Libo. You're very right. I think it is quite a balancing act, right? It's quite a balancing act of not closing ourselves off to the rest of the world, uh, but also appreciating uh, the importance of having to develop our own space. And I think just finding a way to find a balance between those rules. And I, what, I, what I get excited about when, when we talk about the free trade is also this idea that it, it feels like we're also beginning to, to set the tone a bit about how other countries must engage with us rather than almost, you know, when they say you're, like, you're, you're price takers, now at least there's an equal footing around we are all seeing value in each other in terms of in terms of what we bring to the table um uh, and so i think the negotiation is is on a is, is on a more equal path i'm going to ask one more question there are a few questions on the, on the on the chat we will, we will go back to them um i see there's there's a few around the ip piece and i think we, we can address that but there's what there was one question around you know what 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 is taking so long for some of these countries to ratify so not all of them have <laughs> What, what what is the challenge there why are we is it protecting of economies is it you know if this is such a great agreement that is supposed to make everybody win <laughs> what, what are some of the challenges that we have in there it was, that's a critical question and although in the early phases after um, the 2018 extraordinary summit in kigali when the agreement was tabled for signature you know I was at the summit and we didn't know on that day how many countries were going to sign. But as the day progressed, there was a wave, a momentum, so that by the end of that day, 44 countries had signed the agreement. It was unbelievable to, to witness the enthusiasm, the political commitment. But ratification follows signature. And what we have to understand is that all of our countries, even the large diversified economies like South Africa, Nigeria, Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, and so on, Kenya, and, and others, we all have economic and social development agendas at home. We want to create jobs. We want to support sustainable development at home. Some of our countries have really high and very challenging un unemployment records, for example. So the process of industrialization is a priority in the first instance at national level. But we have to recognize that if we are going to industrialize, we may need inputs from the neighboring country. So that brings that connection between trade and the trade liberalization and the industrial mm -hmm. development but it's managing those trade-offs and that's really critical. But what I find really exciting, and I think I can share this, this just to, to illustrate the point, in the most recent discussions that are taking place in, in Accra, we've started to see focus on continental value chain development. And I understand that two sectors are enjoying priority, automotive, and clothing and textiles. Mm -hmm. Because once we start taking a continental perspective mm -hmm. to industrialization, industrial linkages across borders, and taking a look not only at a winner takes all, the big country taking all the opportunities in terms of that sector's development, but looking at how efficiently and effectively we can have value chain linkages that actually cross borders. Yeah. But that requires that we focus on the trade facilitation agenda. We lower the cost of doing business. We reduce the cost of transport. Most goods, are, whether it's inputs or it's, it's final goods going to consumers, go by road transport. And road transport is costly. The regulations are not harmonized. And if they're not harmonized, they're costs associated. So mm. we've got to look at the whole package. So it's a trade and services issues about regulatory harmonization. It's mm. about trade facilitation, reduce time at the border because time is money. And if you're transporting fish or shrimps, 
yeah. my goodness you don't want the consignment staying there two days at the border then you don't have any product left so it's these practical realities that we have to look at so i can well understand level that when it comes to the national level where the minister of trade has to justify to stakeholders in some sectors where jobs are being lost especially also during COVID, to say open the economy for competition now it's tough because they're winners and losers well, but it also focuses on what else we've got to do at home so what industrial policy support? What can we do in terms of skills development? What are the necessary skills in the digital economy? So it means we've got to take a very comprehensive look, not only at the trade agreement, but also what we do in terms of support at home. It's also where we can help one another and where our development partners can help. And often they are asking to say, how can we help? We've got mm -hmm. to have a plan we really got to think about those issues. So I think it's it's a really complex collection of issues, but I can understand that each country, even South Africa, the most diversified on the continent, we have high unemployment, particularly youth unemployment. Yeah. So how do we generate jobs? And other countries are thinking the same. So we really have to balance interests and work together to see how we can benefit across yeah. borders yeah. and really support one another at the continental level. Thanks. Lydia. I love that. I love that together. And I think it's quite a good segue into, into uh, Claudia, who will bring on now, who is from the DTIC and can maybe give us a South African perspective, which is what we love. But thank you very much, because I love also the, the, the value chain conversation. I think Rehem and I have that all the time. I think there's nothing like COVID that has actually shown the importance of creating regional value chains, seeing that the, 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 the borders and, and the imports were disrupted so much that we actually had to look inward and at our neighbors more than we had to look uh, outside around creating those. So I'm excited around what this free trade can actually do to, to, to support that and to maybe even create centers of excellence around certain areas that we, we can go. So thank you very much, uh, Trudy. There are more questions. I will, will bring you back uh, on later and we'll go through them. I just want to make sure that uh, we go to Claudia and I'm also alive to the fact that load shedding is going to happen at four o'clock on her side. So if we can have her presentation before she goes off, uh, that 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 would be great in case uh, ESCOM uh, doesn't want us to be great. We want to make sure she'll be there. But thank you very much. Trudy is still available. We, we will ask her some questions. There were quite a few that came on and we can just go through them and answer those. So thank you so much for that very, very detailed perspective. I'd like to call Claudia, uh, who's going to be coming on now. Claudia Furiel, Furiel from the DTIC, the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition. And she's the director for NEPAD and the African Union in Trade Policy Negotiations and cooperation and the, and the cooperation branch at the DTI. She's responsible for DTI's participation in continental trade and economic work programs, particularly the regional economic industry integration agenda, the Africa continental free trade area negotiations and Africa strategic partnerships. She joined that unit. Uh, she joined uh, um, uh, uh, as a, she was, a, she was appointed as a director for NEPAD African Union in September, 2014. She joined the DTI when it, when it was still called the DTI and also DTIC in 2000. 2009 as deputy director in the same division. Before that, she worked at the Department of International Relations and Cooperation in, in the branch of Africa, uh, and Africa Multilateral from the period of 2007, 2009, and at the Embassy of Japan in the, in the development and economic section from 2000 to 2007. The only thing I know in Japanese is konnichiwa. I don't know if it, that is right, konnichiwa. But welcome, welcome, Claudia, if the team can bring Claudia on. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. We've invited Claudia to come on because really uh, we needed to land the helicopter even more. So now that we've landed it, we need the people to come out of the helicopter so that we can we can get a sense of what is South Africa's perspective on this on this free trade area. How are we approaching it? How are we seeing it? What are we, you know, what are, what are some of the opportunities that we're seeing? I mean, and Trudy made mention around the fact that we have to have our story straight, right? And so what are some of, what are some of the, uh, so what are some of the support mechanisms? How is South Africa approaching these? And what are some of the practicalities for women entrepreneurs 
who want to participate in the space uh, um, and 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 really uh, leverage this free trade area from a South African perspective. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, welcome. I've just brought you on board. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very, very much, uh, Lebo, and good afternoon, colleagues. Um, I hope you're all still with us and that you are finding um, the information that you are receiving um, quite informative and, and that you'll be able to put it to good use. I must admit that um, I'm always so happy to hear Trudy um, speaking because, you know, we've been in these negotiations um, effectively since uh, 2015 when they were launched in Johann Johannesburg coming from an idea in 2012 about the possibility of an African continental free trade area. Um, and as a policy maker and sitting in the government circles, you tend to be very focused on the, the nuts and bolts and the technical aspects, um, as Trudy was mentioning. Um, but to hear it from a very different perspective and how you apply this information um, I think is of critical value, and I, I'm always quite grateful to Trudy for putting it into perspective for us. Um, colleagues, so I will focus on South Africa's role in this process, particularly through the DTIC, um, and what it means to be trade ready. Um, Trudy's spoken about what the legal instrument uh, means and what it covers, and you can see that it's, it's a very comprehensive trade agreement. Um, and as Lebo indicated, it's something that you're certainly not going to be able to unpack um, in one session. So we definitely need to have series of sessions on this and, and bring in um, a number of different experts, including customs, uh, who's going to be responsible for making sure that your, your goods or your shrimp or your vegetables don't sit at those border posts um, for longer than is necessary and that there's ease of movement in both your goods and services. So there's a number of issues that we still need to unpack and particularly some of the, um, the services and support that the DTIC um, is, is able to provide. I'm going to... Um, so we just try to find my presentation on this wonderful system. Um, I hope everyone can see it. Um, so what I really want to focus on is just more broadly on the AFCFDA benefits, um, the strategic importance of the AFCFDA and Africa as a whole to South Africa, um, what those detailed opportunities for SA businesses are particularly women and what we've done, not only continentally, and I know that um, our colleague Marie from the AFCFDA Secretariat will focus more specifically on those issues um, and what it means to be trade ready. Um, Trudy mentioned that um, there's still a number of outstanding issues that um, I will then explain a little bit more on in terms of what needs to be um, concluded for us to really be able to start trading in the in the in the true sense um, and then the kind of support that you can expect from the DTIC and of course uh, government more broadly. Um, so colleagues what are oh, sorry just hang on Sorry, um, I do trade. I, I do trade, not IT. <laughs> right. Hang on a second. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, oh, there we go. There we go. Thank you. See, women supporting women, and this is how it should be. <laughs> in trade and in IT. Thanks very much. Um, so apologies for that, colleagues. Um, I will improve my IT skills. Um, uh, thanks to womanomics. 
Um, so colleagues, what are the general benefits of the AFCFTA? And, and as Trudy indicated, it's a very comprehensive trade agreement. Um, traditionally in Africa, you will find uh, regional trade protocols. So we, we are quite used to negotiating um, tariffs um, or uh, protocols on goods, for example. Um, to some extent, um, services. Um, some regions have more experience in services negotiations, but less so than trading goods. Um, and then, of course, all the, the phase two issues that were mentioned in terms of IP, um, competition, investment, e-commerce, as well as uh, a woman in trade protocol. Some of these issues have not been negotiated um, in, a, in an African context at this scale. So you can quite understand why, when we're talking about why is it taking so long and why aren't we starting to trade yet, you can understand the the, the technical um, barriers in terms of capacity and expertise and the capacity building um, that needs to be undertaken as part of the negotiations um, in the AFCFTA. And considering all of these issues, the fact that we have been able to, to reach the level of progress that we have now, and of course, we've had a lot of partners that have supported the process in terms of capacity building, including Tralec and UNCTAD and UNECA and AFDB. Um, this kind of work is necessary so that we can have the best outcome. A truly um, developmental trade agreement that will support and, and benefit all African state parties. Um, so the expected benefits when the trade agreement is implemented in its totality um, would be to enhance intra-Africa trade and not only intra-Africa trade, intra-Africa investment, which is quite important. Um, and this we will have through the progressive elimination of tariffs. And one of the questions that we normally get asked is, so when we start trading, um, Will my products just be able to move duty free into to, um, the, the market at, at in question? Um, the answer is no. Um, this is progressive um, elimination of tariffs over a certain period. Um, and this is where the developmental aspect comes in. It allows countries to kind of mitigate the shocks of reduced um, revenue. Um, there are certain measures and mechanisms in place to assist them, and it also gives them time to use this new market access opportunities um, to, to develop their e economies and to be able to, to take on the shocks of um, tariff liberalization. Um, quite importantly, this is a developmental integration approach to trade on the continent. Um, so we also recognize that we don't just have tariff barriers, and those are not necessarily going to improve intra-Africa trade, they're not going to improve intra-Africa investment, and they're certainly not going to support the economic development of the continent and reduce poverty. So there's also rules to manage non-tariff barriers, um, facilitate customs cooperation, trade facilitation and transit that are very important to move your goods and services across. Um, and enhanced cooperation on technical barriers to trade. And we're talking about that, we're talking about standards, quality infrastructure, et cetera. But quite importantly, one of the key benefits of the AFCFTA is that it enhances legal certainty, certainty and predictability of market access. So you have a trade agreement that tells you how trade will occur. You will have services and um, tariff schedules that will tell you what your market access is meant to be. And then, of course, if member states or state parties are not applying their obligations, there will be recourse to um, a dispute settlement mechanism um, where um, state parties, and this is quite important, it's state parties, not investors, that can take disputes um, to the dispute resolu um, resolution body. Um, importantly, in terms of the developmental element of, of the AFCFDA, is that market integration must be supported and complemented by um, cross-border industrial development um, as well as infrastructure development. So the creation of regional value chains that uh, Trudy went into are of critical importance. I mean, we recognize that we're not all going to be manufacturing 
um, cars to the same capacity, but there certainly is a role for different member states and state parties to fit into the value chain of the automotive sector from either a components uh, perspective, from an assembly perspective, or from a, a complete um, um, manufacturing perspective. So it's how we enhance and, um, and, and enhance our comparative advantages and our competitiveness that is will be key to um, boosting the industrial development of the continent. Um, Trudy's already spoken about the investment climate and how that can be enhanced um, through the continental free trade area and the opportunities that it creates for other countries and third parties to establish themselves um, in one of the territories um, in the, the continent to be able to then benefit um, from the AFCFTA preferences, but at the same time with conditions where we develop um, the local um, economic um, or the local com communities in which they operate. Um, and then quite importantly, we, we all party to regional economic blocks. Um, so the AFCFTA will provide new market access opportunities beyond, for example, from a South African perspective, beyond the SADC market, but opportunities into North Africa, West Africa, Central Africa, and East Africa. So the successful implementation of the AFCFTA is expected to lead to increased productivity, um, diversification of exports, um, because we do not want to, to maintain that relationship where we trade mostly amongst ourselves and with um, the rest of the world um, on basic commodities, but that we are able to um, diversify economies and diversify our production, um, that we can accelerate growth, increase investment, um, and this will lead to in increased employment opportunities and also broadening economic inclusion through the participation of women. Um, so just some interesting stats, um, and we've put this onto the screen so that you have the benefit of keeping this with you. Um, the, the presentation will be shared. But if you look at some of the World Bank statistics, the AFCFTA will boost regional income by about 7%, or roughly 450 billion um, US dollars. Um, and this includes um, increased wages for women and lifting 30 million people out of extreme poverty by 2035. And you may wonder why we use 2035 as the, as the reference point. Um, if you look at the modalities for tariff liberalization that um, Trudy um, alluded to in her presentation, um, it will take about 14 to 15 years um, for the complete or total implementation of the African continental free trade area. So taking that into account and taking us to 2035, um, it's expected that the AFCFTA would be in its full implementation by then um, and that all at least 97% of the tariffs would be liberalized. Um, and this is the expected benefits from um, that tariff liberalization and implementation of the AFCFTA. Um, by that same period, the volume of total exports from Africa is expected to increase by 29%. Um, out of that, it's um, expected that African exports um, or intra-Africa exports rather would increase by 81%. Um, and exports outside of the continent by 19%. Um, and as we indicated, while the AFCFTA certainly will um, support um, intra-Africa trade in terms of reduced tariffs, um, if you look at some of the um, benefits that have accrued from um, other regional trade protocols in the continent, the benefits are really seen when we start looking at the reduction of non-tariff barriers um, and trade facilitation me uh, measures. So it's great to, to reduce tariffs, but if I can't, if I don't have the infrastructure or the, the facilities or the support to move my products across um, the borders, those market access opportunities or reduced tariffs are going to mean nothing um, to me. So why is the AFCFTA strategically important to, to South Africa? Um, if you look at South Africa's major export destinations, um, these include rest of Africa, EU and China, they account for about 62% of South Africa's total exports. Um, the African market um, was a destination for 
just under 27% of South Africa's total exports in 2018. And in 2019, 55% of these exports to Africa were manufactured products. So this already shows you that the content or the structure of trade in the continent is one that supports the trade of value added products. So there's great opportunity for us to trade um, in higher value added products as opposed to our export of raw materials to the rest of the world only. So tra changing the trade structure of the continent is certainly expected to be enhanced through the AFCFTA measures. Currently, SADC is the most significant trading block for South Africa's exports and imports, and this accounts for about 70% of all of South Africa's exports to Africa, with some of those key countries being Botswana, Namibia, Mozambique, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. So really our neighboring countries um, that are, we are trading mostly with. So the opportunities that will be presented through the AFCFDA um, are vast in terms of really improving our market access and our footprint into the rest of the continent. Um, Sorry, specifically, if we start looking at um, uh, Northwest, Central and East Africa. Um, the implementation of the FCFTA colleagues, and this is um, South African specific, um, it has the potential to grow South Africa's share of intra-Africa exports by 7% by 2035. Um, and that is a huge percentage to, to consider um, in, in the next 10 to 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 12 years. Um, in fact, South Africa's president indicated that if South Africa could supply just 2% of the almost 3 trillion um, rand in manufactured goods to African imports from the rest of the world, we would increase our annual GDP alone by 1.2%. Um, so it shows you how valuable the African market is to South Africa, um, as well as to all African economies in terms of the benefits of integration. Um, specifically, some of the, the benefits that we expect is a reduction of tariff barriers uh, faced by South African companies in the rest of the continent. And we're expecting that that would drop by um, from 4.3% to about 1.2% by 2035. Um, the reduction of costs faced by South African companies would decrease um, to about 19.9% from um, 35% currently. Um, we would um, improve real income growth um, of 0.38%, exports growth of 1.4%, and import growth of about 2% by the same period. Um, the removal of tariff and non-tariff barriers would result in almost 2% in real income growth 12.5% in exports growth and 14.9% in import growth by 2035. So colleagues, these are just some of the stats in terms of what is expected to, um, uh, the benefits that are expected to be derived by South Africa specifically through the full implementation of the AFCFDA. Of course, this takes a number of assumptions into account. Um, we know that this is a comprehensive free trade area. We know that uh, it's the largest FTA in terms of the number of countries. Um, we've never embarked on such a big um, FTA negotiation um, as a continent. There are going to be teething problems. There will be implementation challenges, but it's how we will deal with these challenges that will really uh, put the AFCFTA agreement to the test. But I think that in terms of the political will, um, and the economic um, commitment to making the AFCFDA um, a realization, I think um, it's something that we should um, applaud. And I think that it will certainly assist in making the AFCFDA a reality um, for all member states and, and, and its people. Then in terms of the opportunities for South African women in the AFCFDA, um, you may um, recall that in 2020, um, during South Africa's chairship of the African Union, um, President Ramaphosa announced, uh, announced the launch of the Decade of Women's Financial and Economic Inclusion um, until 2013. Claudia? Yes. 
Claudia, sorry to interrupt, my dear. I know this is a very important section that you're talking about. Your screen seems to have uh, frozen in terms of your presentation. Ah, now we can see it. Now you're okay. back. Sorry, you were not moving from slide to slide, so it was stuck on one slide. So we were not sure if it's okay. the tech or perfect. Thank you so much. I'm going to come over. You can see it now. It's fine now. Okay, great. Yes, you can go to the right slide. Thank you so much, my dear. Thank you. Right. So you should see opportunities for South African women in the AFC FDA in front of you. Um, I hope it's not ESCOM that is already being difficult. Um, perfect. We can so see you. Thank you. You can see it. Okay, great. Um, so. Um, that was announced, and I think the idea was also with the entry into force of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement um, and how we make sure that the agreement is inclusive and that it is beneficial to all economies, but that we also ensure that we enhance the opportunities for the most vulnerable segment of our populations. Um, this was launched and of course, there was a, a direct link to the African continent or free trade area um, with the announcement of an inclusion of a protocol of women in trade in the AFCFTA. Um, and I, I always try to grapple with this idea because I think a protocol on women in trade is, um, is critical. Um, and of course, it can link to a number of um, gender mainstreaming um, uh, provisions in the agreement. Um, and how you tap into those as well. But I think that the most important area that we need to focus on as economies and as a continent are the national and regional initiatives to really support women in accessing the benefit of trade agreements. Um, if you look at, for example, the SADC trade protocol that exists, um, the question I would pose is how have women been able to access or benefit from those free trade opportunities that exist it, it, with, within the, the region itself. And, and the answer, I think, won't be great. Um, and I think it's because, number one, we haven't created enough awareness. Um, I think we're trying to do better um, through the AFCFDA. But we haven't been able to specifically look at how we support women and youth and how we assist them in benefiting from these, these trade agreements. Uh, I don't think that most um, um, small and medium enterprises actually even know uh, what the uh, what the trade static trade protocol entails, let alone what the AFCFTA agreement will entail. So how we communicate this information is key. How we support women and create initiatives to support export development, export promotion, and export facilitation is going to be critical to um, women and youth participation in the AFCFTA, regardless of the provisions of the agreements, regardless of the opportunities that will be um, created through market access, through investment opportunities. Um, you're not likely to see those benefits if we don't do better nationally and continentally in terms of real tangible initiatives to support women in trade. Um, and then, of course, this would also include access to finance. So a directorate of women in trade has been established within the AFCFTA secretariat to facilitate and enhance the participation of women and youth in the AFCFTA. And Marie from the secretariat will probably uh, explain a little bit more of what that would entail. Um, as South Africa, the critical importance, and this is not just for South Africa, but it would be for all member states, would be to explore and implement national policies that are specifically targeted at women and youth. Um, this could be preferential procurement. Um, it could be preferential services, um, as well as incentives and export promotion activities that will provide the necessary technical assistance um, for Human, women and youth enterprises to benefit from the AFCFTA. And of course, what is also quite important is to ensure that the AFCFTA is a jobs-driven strategy um, with a special focus on the expansion of labor-intensive sectors, um, especially those with strong and rural, rural um, women and rural employment linkages. So given all these opportunities and all this wonderful work that is already being undertaken at the level of the AFCFTA, uh, the question on everyone's mind is, 
the AFCFTA um, or preferential trade under the AFCFTA was launched on the 1st of January 2021. Um, why am I not able to start trading or what does it mean? So, of course, that was the operationalization of trade preferences. Um, but realistically, there needs to be a minimum uh, legal requirements in place for us to be able to start trading preferentially. Um, and I will go through those in terms of where we are and what still needs to be done um, with the expectation that some of this work will be concluded um, by the end of this year and adopted by an extraordinary summit in February next year. So currently, as of September 2021, 20, we have 39 countries that have ratified the AFCFTA. Um, we have um, Tanzania and the DRC that have also ratified or concluded their national um, ratification uh, approvals. Um, and what is outstanding is for them to formally notify or um, deposit um, the, the instrument of ratification with the African Union. Um, once that is done, which is just really a legal um, step, um, this would take us to 41 countries that have ratified the AFCFTA. And of course, to operationalize preferences, we need to finalize an agreement on tariff offers um, with accompanying rules of origin. Um, this is in the process of being finalized for the 90% um, percentage of tariff lines, which will be liberalized over um, equal installments um, in a phase down approach with the remaining 7% of sensitive products um, that will be liberalized over a longer period and 3% allocated to those really, really, very real um, sensitive areas that um, economies cannot open up um, at this stage or in the foreseeable future. So currently we have 42 um, tariff offers from 10 individual member states. So those are countries that are submitting a, a tariff offer in the individual capacity. Um, and then those that are combined um, offers from four customs unions, namely SACU, um, CEMEC, um, ECOWAS, and the EFC. So we are all in the process of finalizing a 90% tariff offer. As SACU, we are very close to finalizing our 90% tariff offer that's in line with the modalities. Um, and this will be submitted to um, the next Council of Ministers of Trade for endorsement um, and then adoption by the summit for provisional um, implementation. And the reason why we say provisional implementation is that your, your tariff schedules will only be final when the 7% and the 3% um, product categories um, have also been submitted. And that is expected to be finalized during the course of 20. Um, 22. Um, so in terms of the conclusion and finalization of outstanding negotiations on rules of origin, Trudy mentioned that we have roughly just under 13% of um, outstanding rules of origin. Um, currently, we have an agreement on 87.8% .8 of tariff lines um, with some of the key chapters on sugar, um, clothing and textiles, edible oils, and automotives um, remaining to be finalized. Um, and this is specifically important, colleagues, because um, in order for us to industrialize, um, in order for us to uh, diversify our economies, we need to invest in our productive capacity. So to bring in products um, where we have some productive capacity on the continent, um, that will be competing preferentially with inputs or products from the rest of the world is not going to support a made in Africa approach. Um, and this is really where we want to go, where we can um, enhance our productive capacity, enhance where we've got some productive capacity um, to um, cooperate to bring that production to a level where we could support the, the needs of the continent um, uh, domestically or in, in the continent itself. So those outstanding rules of origin have now been prioritized uh, by the ministers. Um, and you will actually see some discussions on some of these areas um, at the level of the Intrafrica trade fair that is coming up. 
Um, so I really do um, invite you and encourage you to, to follow some of these discussions and to even influence some of these discussions. But of course, with the idea of um, creating incentives for investment in the continent to boost productive capacity in some of these areas. Um, so those are the outstanding rules of origin. And of course, once we have um, rules of origin agreed on some of these sectors, then you would be able to pr uh, trade preferentially on these items as well. Um, in terms of trading services, the conclusion and finalization of the uh, negotiations in the five priority sectors um, is ongoing. Um, we have 43 member states that have submitted initial services offers, um, 15 individual member states and 28 um, member states um, from three RECs have submitted combined um, offers respectively. So it's, we are now going through a process of requesting offers and trying to verify um, the, the, the offers that have been submitted, of course, with the idea that we need to have better offers, offers amongst each other and better services commitments amongst each other than what we have given at the level of the WTO. So the finalization and adoption of these schedules and offers um, are expected to be um, done by the end of 2021, probably adopted by February. Um, and then of course, once we have these 90% um, provisional schedules adopted, the market access opportunities for South African business um, will be confirmed. Uh, both in terms of products, um, as well as the industries, as well as the treatment of goods um, on, on those product lines. Um, of course, with a, a critical um, principle of a negotiations is variable geometry. So it doesn't mean that once we start trading preferentially, you're going to be able to trade with everyone on the continent. Um, not everybody has ratified the agreement. Not everyone has submitted tariff offers or have finalized the tariff offers. Um, we have some countries that still need some technical support to finalize their tariff offers. Um, so those that are implementation ready, um, you would be able to have market access into and the other state parties would follow. We also have state parties that haven't submitted tariff offers. And then of course, we've got offers from member states that have not um, ratified the agreement. So you're likely to have preferential market access once these offers have been submitted. Um, and speaking from a SACU, South African perspective, um, into ECOWAS, SEMAC, Egypt, um, and the EAC as a starting point um, in the Im implementation of, of um, tariff uh, schedules. Uh, as I indicated, the remaining 7 and 3% categories will be confirmed hopefully early 2022. Um, and then we would be able to, to finalize and attach the, the tariff schedules to the AFCFTA agreement. The conclusion of services negotiations, we of course try to also prioritize and ensure that we try to conclude it in tandem with the, the goods negotiations. Um, I think that we probably would have some um, a, a good idea of where we are probably by February as well in terms of the conclusion of some of those schedules. Again, it wouldn't be um, the same um, schedules that would be implemented across the continent. We would have some services opportunities confirmed um, with some key um, partner states that have submitted their, their offers. Um, challenges in the AFCFTA negotiations, as I indicated, is implementation readiness. Different member states and state parties are at different levels of readiness to implement. And this talk, we're talking about um, domestic legislation, we're talking about finalization of tariff offers, um, customs documentation, etc. Um, as South African SACU, we are basically implementation ready. Um, with the exception of having finalized our 90% tariff offer, which will be done so soon. And then, of course, the impact of COVID-19 has also delayed the um, negotiations to some extent and even the ratification um, process by some member states uh, with priority be given to the, the national health and um, economic development priorities. 
Um, some of the DTIC and government support provided, and I'm almost done, colleagues, um, is to create a conducive environment um, and we continue to try to improve the ease of doing business for women and youth entrepreneurs. There are current efforts to improve the competitiveness of our sectors through industry master plans, um, which will be coupled with financial support to upgrade the local uh, sector. And this is work that um, is underway through the DTIC. Um, each of the master plans include AFCFDA chapters um, on key sectors such as auto, steel, poultry, sugar, agro-processing, clothing, clothing and machinery. Um, and of course, in order for the AFCFDA to be implemented effectively at the national level, um, a whole of government implementation plan will be put into effect. And of course, this will be done um, jointly with um, relevant key stakeholders. Um, Government is also trying to identify export champions to support SMEs and black industrialists to gear up for the new market access that will be provided. Um, the implementation of export development and promotion support measures um, is currently being developed or tightened up by the DTIC's Trade Invest Africa and the Trade Invest South Africa and incentive schemes. Um, so I have put some contact information in the last slide um, about what kind of support you could receive in terms of getting your business export ready um, or how you could um, benefit from some of the market access opportunities that are provided through the AFCFDA. Specifically targeting women and youth colleagues, um, we have established an interdepartmental task team um, comprising of the DTIC and the Department of Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities um, with other stakeholders to be identified. And really the focus here will be on facilitating and coordinating national initiatives and programs um, to ensure that women and youth are able to benefit from the opportunities of the AFCFDA. And this will include both national um, programs as well as collaboration initiatives um, continentally as well. Um, so some of the practical support measures that we need to identify is access to trade finance, training, provision of information. And I see there was a question online about why or how do you get information about these legal measures and the agreement, etc. So this is part of how we need to enhance our efforts as government to ensure that you have all the information that you need to be able to make an informed decision about your exports or about your, 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 your investment. And this would also include export promotion as well as export development. So colleagues, um, this agreement, again, it's not meant to only ensure that some of your key economies or your more, more diversified economies benefit. Um, it's meant to, to, to ensure that there are spread and equal benefits across all member states for the benefit um, of all the people in the continent and to reduce poverty and unemployment. Um, so in order to achieve this, um, trade integration needs to be accompanied by programs to support African industrialization and the creation of regional value chains. And of course, we are coordinating across all government spheres with relevant stakeholders, particularly through the NEDLAC um, structure to ensure that the benefit of the AFCFDA opportunities um, are available to all South Africans and South African private sector. Of course, once the tariff and service schedules are finalized, you would have a clearer indication of the market access opportunities. From a South African point, um, what are market access opportunities we've got into the rest of the continent, and the same for other African member states to get that certainty of the market access they would be receiving in, in South Africa as well. Um, one of the critical issues that I wanted to mention is that, you know, once we get into the rest of the continent, um, we forget the importance of working with South African missions. Um, and I would like to encourage you that whether you want to trade with Nigeria or Kenya or Egypt, that you allow and use the, F so the South African mission in that country, which is there to serve you, um, the opportunity of the, the intellectual um, information, the intellectual property on the ground information that they they have in working with those countries to support you in setting up those appointments um, that you need and to making those deals work. They will also assist you 
in facilitating export development. And in any case, in any um, circumstances where you may experience some challenges um, in operating in a, in, a, in a different country, that they would be there to support you. In terms of the phase two negotiations that Trudy mentioned, IP, competition, investment, um, digital trade, etc. Those negotiations, um, the preparations therefore are underway. So all of the committees have been established, their rules of procedure have been established, um, situational analysis have been established and capacity building initiatives underway so that we can equip all member states to be able to participate meaningfully in the negotiations of those protocols. So that is expected to take place. Um, with the expectation that we would be able to conclude those um, text-based protocols um, by the end of 2022. Um, we remain um, at your disposal and I've included some important contacts. So if there's uh, additional information or additional contacts that you would like to, to connect with, we're happy to assist you. Um, so my email address um, and Mr. Sandiretini's um, email address is there from a trade policy negotiations perspective. Um, and then for Trade in Best Africa, the contact details have been pro provided as well. Um, so um, just in conclusion, colleagues, um, my appeal is don't wait for, for government to make those opportunities available for you. Um, the work is being done. I think it's time that we hold government accountable. Um, and that you tell us what it is that you need um, in terms of support to be able to benefit from not only the AFCFDA, but other trade um, arrangements that South Africa is party to. Um, thanks very much, colleagues, and apologies for taking so much time. Uh, not at all. I think, thank you so much. I think, as we said, rightfully so, that uh, this kind of topic, you can't have it, uh, you know, pay lip service and you will know because uh, together with yourself and Trudy, you were part of our webinar series where we just thought we would touch on the topic in an hour. And in fact, it turned out to be out of, out of the entire series that we had, uh, probably the most popular session that we had and the one that ran over the longest. So we know that this will take some time. And, and I can imagine that even some of the things that you've raised might require a session on their own. But thank you so much for for your, for your uh, perspectives. Um, thank you also, because I think the reason that we, we have the DTI, and, and I think as Womanomics, we're very fortunate that we, we have um, a, a, an MOU with the DTI around supporting women in trade on the continent, particularly. I think the importance of it was, you know, it's you don't want to go into a country um, where you want to do business with and have a, a country battle before you can even begin a business battle. And so knowing where the DTI is focusing on, knowing where some of the the the, folk, the, 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 the areas are, you know, taking advantage of the missions, et cetera, I think is a very important thing so that when, when you land in those spaces, there's at least a, a bit a bit more of of, of, of prospects that you will be successful in that space. So thank you very much. I loved the the, the point that you made around, uh, you know, when you have when you have some of these um, uh, trade facilitation spaces, when you have when you um, uh, are focusing on facilitation and coordination, I think is what you said. You must have programs that are actually able to support them. Otherwise, you know, they they, they you have trade integration and liberalization, but there are no programs to support this industrialization and the regional value chains. So my first question to you, and, and one that I know has been coming up, um, which 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 of these value chains is, is the DTI particularly promoting? Um, um, given particularly this 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 issue of of, of uh, rules of origin, etc. What, where, where, where is the focus around that? If you can put your camera on, please. Um, no, thanks. And I think that's a very important question. Um, I don't think there's going to be a limitation on the, the, the value chains that we will promote. Um, of course, uh, a key priority for us now would be the autos value chain. Um, mm -hmm. A number of countries are trying to develop the auto sector. They've got policy, industrial policies on automotives. Um, as I indicated earlier, we can't all be producing the same things. We can't all be um, producing apples and expecting to trade apples with one another, for example. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's about how do we ensure that the benefits of the auto sector um, accrue to all different regions um, mm. taking into consideration the 
capabilities, the capacity, um, and some will be in manufacturing, um, others will be in provision of components. So in terms of the master plans that I indicated, this is where the regional value chains will be prioritized. But of course, um, the testing now would be how do we ensure that um, trying to, to agree on rules that, that would promote the development of the auto sector in the continent, how do we look at um, what they call now an auto pact um, across different regions in the continent, some of the players are trying to benefit from the automotive mm -hmm. sector. Um, mm -hmm. So it doesn't exclude any regional value chain, um, but of course they will develop um, at different um, times um, and at different speeds. Mm. Okay, I, I hear that. So, is there for these for these particular uh, value chains that we know that are are, are ongoing? Is there any uh, matching policy or development support from the DTI, particularly for those? Absolutely, this is it's part of the incentives that we we will be working on in the type of support mm -hmm. that the DTIC will provide, um, and also the financing. Um, through the master plan um, strategies that will be in place, or in some already, of course, are in place. And just to indicate that this is not just developed by the DTIC, the, the master mm. plans are actually developed between government and industry players. So it is input by dis different spheres of society to ensure that the best outcomes and how we can really develop those industries and those sectors. Okay. All right, that sounds great. Um, one of the things that we, one of the things that we 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 are quite um, adamant about when we talk as womanomics is when we looked particularly at at the free trade area, and we know that the the the, the idea of supporting women and making sure that women are part of this was kind of stated in the preamble, and pretty much nowhere else. And so we always said that sometimes we come up with these great agreements in terms of great intent. Um, and not necessarily follow up with the monitoring and evaluation to make sure that we actually keep on track, right? So we will have this, and I think that's part of the reason why we are very keen as an organization even to develop like an index that really begins to track and monitor women's participation, particularly uh, as part of this free trade area. Um, so, um, so that's one of the things that we think is important. But if you look at this, I mean, uh, you know, sometimes they, these these agreements they, they they're great on paper, uh, but are resourced are resourced poorly when it comes to monitoring them. Um, and 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 sometimes then we 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 lament that there's lip service being paid to them. Um, so what 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 are your thoughts around what has been designed? If there's anything around uh, these elements of monitoring them and any mechanisms that have been put in place around making sure that. I suppose continentally, but also even from a South African perspective, in terms of the value that that it will be adding to 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 the country. Uh, you're on mute. I think. Are you muted? Uh, yes. Sorry. So, uh, <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So, so, you know, yeah. government is an enabler of trade. Yeah. We, we will provide the policy or the trade agreements. Um, the beneficiaries are entrepreneurs and the South yeah. African private sector. Um, so I think through, through um, export councils, there's a lot of opportunity to monitor some of the work that is being done, but it's about holding each other accountable um, and holding government accountable. Um, yeah. You know, so I think it, it needs to be a cooperation-led arrangement. And of course, um, our president is very committed to this. Um, and there will certainly be um, a very structured monitoring and evaluation mechanism. We do so through some of the reporting structures already in place um, through government in terms of um, the, the progress that we've made in negotiations and implementation. Um, so there are really some government-wide um, monitoring and evaluation structures in place. Um, but I think you're right. I think we need a broader monitoring and evaluation mechanism um, where we can certainly identify um, challenges and how we can address some of those challenges and even look at better ways of enhancing the opportunities of the AFC. 
Yeah, yeah. I think I, I think that I, I agree that that would be important. Uh, and I know that you mentioned some of the the initiatives that or some of the areas that the AFCTA in terms of some of the intergovernmental uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, areas that you've got. Um, is there an AFCTA in 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 the DTIC? Is there an AFCTA? Uh, um, um, or a department that's focusing on growth and economic development, particularly, and and how do you, how do you, how do entrepreneurs interface with that? Is that through you? Is that through your colleague? How how does that happen? Oh, load shedding has hit. <laughs> I think we might have lost Claudia. She's, I hope she comes back on. I, she did mention that load shedding uh, would be coming uh, to her around four o'clock. So I think if anything, ESCOM has given us an extra 10 minutes uh, leniency. I do know that there was a bit of a challenge in some of the slides that she was sharing. So what I will do right now, just know that uh, we will be sharing the slides. She's trying to reconnect as we speak so we can carry on the conversation. But what I will do at the moment is that I will also just share, I think the one slide that she had towards the end uh, which was really focusing on some of the contact details. So if people do want to get those contact details, um, um, let me just make sure that we can put that on. If people do want to get some of those contact details, that they can take them down uh, so that while, while we have Claudia uh, coming back. No problem. I was just putting up your last slide for just people to see if they if 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 they want to take the contact details and just to let them know that we will be sharing the slides. So if people do want to 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 see them and see some of the contacts um, and also um, um, just also to also encourage them to ask questions in the chat function if there's any more questions that they had. I think we were talking about uh, the 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 AFCTA particular support within the DTI before we got cut off. Um, that would be us, um, the trade policy negotiations branch. Um, but the AFCFTA is not something that can be headed um, by one specific um, division. Um, of course, it is coordinated from a negotiations and policy perspective um, and the legal implementation through our division. But the real, you know, the nuts and bolts of the AFCFTA implementation and how we're going to determine um, its effectiveness um, is definitely going to lie with the other branches of the DTIC, um, with your focal point being um, Trade Invest Africa. Um, yeah. So th those are the two key contacts that we've put. And of course, um, this doesn't take away from the, the role of the other government departments. Um, we have Department of Agriculture, for example, that is um, providing a very clear critical role in the negotiations and in the implementation mm -hmm. as well. Um, you've got SARS that provides a, a, and that would lead on the customs elements, um, trade mm -hmm. facilitation and transport, um, a transit act, um, aspects of the AFCFDA. Mm -hmm. So the AFCFDA will really only work when it is indeed a truly government owned initiative, but um, more importantly, a truly South African um, owned initiative, then you would see um, the benefits accruing to, to South Africans. Um, and of course, for the continent to benefit, it needs to be a government, uh, a continent-wide, sorry, um, owned initiative, yeah. Of course, of course. One of the things I, I know that you mentioned in our, in our sessions as we were as we were, we were preparing for this, I think it was a very important point that you made around the fact that um, it's, it's, it's really is wonderful if 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 even at it's great if at a continental level you 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 have these policies around what we're trying to do with women etc cetera, etc cetera. but if at a local if at a local level it's not even 
sorted out, right? It, it really doesn't make a difference. And I think that that's also the point that Trudy made that even as you have this agreement that is cutting across many countries, really it's about the story that you have as a country. Uh, and, and only if that country, if only if that story is sorted, can, can you actually, can you actually uh, be able to leverage uh, properly what is being put in place continentally and across across different countries? Yeah. What, are, what are your thoughts around commenting around um, where we are around some of those things, uh, particularly as they pertain to women in this space? Um, you, you're quite right because that, that's why you know um, I, I'm very excited about a protocol on women in trade, yeah. um, but I don't think that is that's going to be um, the panacea for 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 women um, um, involvement and women benefits in in any trade agreement. Yeah. Um, the, what we do nationally, and if we don't get our house in order at a national level. Um, you can have all these trade agreements, you can have all these best endeavors on paper, um, and they're going to mean absolutely nothing to, to anybody. So even to influence what would go into a protocol on women in trade, you would need to know what your priorities are nationally to ensure yeah. that women and youth would participate meaningfully in this process. So the work starts already at home, um, and this is why the establishment of that task team is so critical, because it's no longer a matter of talking about the importance of gender mainstreaming. Um, it's really about how do we do that and how do we start doing that um, in the context of trade and economic development. Um, so it's no longer lip service. There's concrete action that is in, in the pipeline, um, yeah. but it's about concrete action um, in terms of national initiatives to support women. Um, and that would go a long way in ensuring that women are able to maximize the benefits of um, intra-Africa trade and intra-Africa investment, not the mm -hmm. protocol in itself. I agree. That's true. So I think a lot of what, what you and, and Trudy have shared has been really, I think, I mean, it's one of the things that we, we really lament about in terms of the work that we do, which is connecting women to information and insights and 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 opportunities and 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 i think um where we you know people we assume that people know but actually they don't and 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 i think it's important that we are able to 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 find places where people can access the information very easily and i know that on this particular campus one of the things that we do encourage is even our partner organizations to to have a, a, an exhibition store where we can put some of this information so i know after this session i'm hoping to work with yourselves and trudy and just make sure that even as the information is out there we can have it here where people can come back and, and log in and get it because i think some of this information that you're sharing is important one more question that i want to ask uh before i call um uh, trudy to come back on and 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 we have a conversation as we wait for marie i know that uh marie is um is 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 was still traveling uh she was traveling uh to accra uh, as of this morning and i know that her flight is delayed she has landed she's trying to get herself uh, to be able to join the session on time so we're crossing our fingers that she can join the session particularly because i know that the the, the secretariat is very keen i think as part of their work as part of this uh women in trade protocol to engage with women and, and hear what are some of the issues or some of the, the thoughts that women have around this AFCTA? So I think she's 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 really keen to be part of the session, but we we played by ear because things things do happen. So one question, uh, Claudia, and then I will I will also then ask Trudy because I think there are questions that relate for for both of you. The first the, the one question I want to ask is um, um, export councils. What are they and and, and how and how and how can can they support this AFCTA journey? We've heard a lot about export councils, but I don't know that everybody or people know how they work, and particularly your views of how they can plug into this this journey of the AFCTA. Uh, Claudia, have we lost Claudia again? Or she's on mute? Ah, oh, shame. Okay, her connection, her connection is unstable. Unfortunately, it is, um, 
it is it is escom doing the best uh trudy i'm going to ask that we bring you on back on there are some questions i think we didn't get to um uh, as part of your session but i think there are others that have come up which i think are, are very um are very are very uh, um pertinent to some of the things that you're saying one of the things that i did want to ask and i wanted to ask the both of you so maybe when claudia comes back um, she she can also uh, comment on this. I know that you 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 made particular mention around this AFCTA also um, not uh, taking into consideration what already exists in terms of the um, uh, the other agreements that we have. So the RECs that we currently have, and and you know you talked about SACU, SADC, etc. In your view, how how successful have those been? You're on mute. I think you're on mute, um, Trudy. Team, is Trudy's sound coming through? Can you hear? I think you're still on mute. We're unable to hear you. Just hold on a second. Can you speak?
Thanks so much, Leva. This is a really important question, and it relates also to the fact that the RECs that are recognized by the African Union are designated building blocks of the AFCFTA. And the reason is very clear, because within the RECs, a lot of consolidation and trade integration of different kinds has already taken place. So, for example, if we look at total intra-Africa trade, more than half of that intra-Africa trade takes place within SADC. So what you see there is that within the SADC free trade area, and then keeping in mind that within SADC is SAKU, the Southern African Customs Union. So we really have a customs union contained in the SADC free trade area. Those countries are fairly well integrated when it comes to to cross-border trade. And so what you see is a very similar pattern in the EAC, where again, mm. there's a lead economy or a large economy in Kenya. In West Africa, one sees the same in ECOWAS, because of course there you've got Nigeria as the big economy and, and a number of other quite large economies as well. So it makes sense for us to build on what exists already. Now, in the case of SAKU, this is an interesting one because SAKU is about, it's a customs union, so it's basically about trade in goods. There's no agreement on trade in services. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if you travel to Namibia or Botswana, Eswatini, Lesotho, you will find that South Africa's services companies are very well represented there in the financial services sector, logistics, retail, communication, MTN, for example, and Vodacom, mm. you'll find them all over. So it's a really interesting um, analysis that we have to do because there is market integration which takes place even in yeah. the absence of, of trade agreements and specific provisions on liberalizing trade. And what the trade agreements then can do is build on and enhance that. And I think and consolidate some of the important regulatory issues because, for example, in the services sectors, um, often domestic regulations are where the real market impediments are. You've got to qualify with certain domestic regulations. You need a license to establish a phone company or a yeah. bank. You can't simply go across and say, this is a good opportunity, let's set up business there. So a lot of regulatory requirements, the domestic regulation aspects of market access are really important. And sometimes, even where a country has not opened its market, say in, in the General Agreement on Trade and Services, Tanzania is a good example here, you will still find foreign participation. So if you walk down the streets of Dodoma or Dar es Salaam, you can count the number of foreign banks that are there. But if you look at the services liberalization outside the EAC, under the WTO General Agreement on Trade and Services, they have done very little. They've only opened one sector, and that's tourism. So there's a, there's a reality check that we've got to do to understand how particularly trade and services takes place. So um, I think the reality is, Lebo, let's face it, if you and I have a big bag of dollars or money and we go to a country and say, you know what, I really want to establish a phone company, a mobile phone company. You know what, the minister might well just say, go and help Lebo and Trudy, get, get that no. foreign direct investment and sort out all the regulatory problems with it. That's, I think, the market reality. So sometimes, we've, but you and I don't have that big bag of money. So, exactly. <laughs> so I think this is where we've got to help women entrepreneurs in terms of access to finance, because access to finance is often conditional upon those traditional collateral requirements ownership of property and in many countries ownership of, of of property is not permitted for certain categories of property for women or simply does not exist because of existing inequalities so we got to change that i agree and i we think that, 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 that. that that's one of the issues that you know one of the biggest issues we know there's a there's a big funding gap for women and one of the issues is exactly that is some of the societal norms that we have around uh, property, collateral assets that they can exactly. actually bring to 
bring funding. Okay, Trudy, I see Marie has joined us just in time. I'm so excited about that. So before we, we I know we've got 30 minutes left in our session, so I want to make sure that we can we can leverage uh, also her thoughts in this. And then if there's any final round of questions, we will we 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 will we will bring uh, we will we will bring you both on board again. But Marie, so wonderful that you are able to join us uh, after quite a marathon leg. I know of of travel, and we appreciate that even as you are traveling today that you are able to join us. Marie is joining us from the Secretariat, um, so she's going to I think give us a. a big insight into what is the secretariat and particularly how do entrepreneurs how are entrepreneurs able to to actually uh, uh, participate and and i think more importantly leverage and engage with the secretariat as as they are wanting to leverage the africa free trade agreement so just to read a bit about marie marie providence mugangu uh, is an international trade lawyer from the drc democratic Democratic Republic of Congo. She previously worked as a legal associate at the Office of the Legal Council of the AU Commission, where she provided legal advice and services to the AU member states and organs. She also worked as a trade policy analyst at UNCTAD, uh, the Regional Office for Africa, and was part of the UNCTAD AFCTA advisory team during the AFC AFCFTA negotiations. She also supported AU member states within the framework of UNCTAD AF. AFCFTA support program to eliminate non-tariff barriers, increase leg regularity, transparency, and promote industrial diversification. She's currently the gender and trade expert within the Secretariat, where she provides technical and coordination support on the preparatory work and engagement towards the Africa Continental Free Trade Women in Trade Proto Protocol. She holds a Master's of Law specializing in international trade from the University of Cape Town, yay, and a Bachelor's of Laws from the Catholic University of East Africa in Kenya. So wonderful, uh, Marie, that you could make it today. Uh, thank you so much. I will now uh, hand over to you. Uh, to 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 engage with us. We have you on screen. Oh my word! <laughs> tech, tech connection is playing games with us today. <laughs> I think she's trying to connect. She's on, but I think there must be a bit of a of a between Escom and uh, 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 connection across, I think we're, we're being particularly challenged as much as technology needs to be an enabler. Uh, one of the key issues I know as we were uh, 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 putting together, rolling out this particular platform was actually some of the access to infrastructure that you can have a really great platform, but if the infrastructure around it is not there to support it, it doesn't work. So while we wait uh, for Marie, um, I want to, I'm gonna call Trudy, my friend back on because there was another question I did want to ask you. Uh, so if you're able to come back on, that would be wonderful because I think you were touching particularly on some of the questions that, um, some of the questions that um, um, I think are important for entrepreneurs and some of the issues that they need to kind of engage with, which I really want us to kind of touch base on in terms of thinking about what are some of the, what are some of the, um, what are some of the questions that entrepreneurs need to ask if they want to leverage this this particular trade agreement? But I think trade agreements just in general, what are some of the key considerations? Because I know that you started talking very much around some of the practical considerations. But if entrepreneurs are sitting on the other side now and saying, what can I ask? What do, what do I need to know? What are some of those considerations that 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 they some of those questions that they need to ask to make sure they have the right information? Thanks so much, Lee. With this, it was on the very practical implementation and access to opportunities for traders across the continent. And what we really need to... Can you hear me? Perfectly, yes. Perfect. Um, <laughs> is that trade agreements are not reader-friendly. And we ran a course at Trilac on reading and interpreting international trade agreements, which is incredibly popular because I'm an economist, but I find it very daunting to read or 700 pages or more of legal text. So what we do need is, first of all, to demystify these legal agreements. In other words, exactly what do the provisions in the SPS Annex mean? How do you read a tariff schedule? Where do I find the product that I want to sell in the HS code? So what is 
the particular applicable tariff. So it really is so important that we're able to provide accessible information. It's no good just putting the agreement on a website and saying we have complied with transparency and accessibility of information. Maybe it's not that easy. So this is where some of the contacts that Claudia has shared with us today for South Africa are so important. Because often a quick phone call to an expert, say, within the Department of Trade and Industry can help you resolve a problem very, very quickly. But it is also important that we have guides to rules of origin, for example, a guide to reading the tariff schedule, a guide to classifying your product so that you know whether, in fact, you will be able to get access to a lower tariff. Is your product on that list or is it excluded? So those are really important technical issues. But more and more, what we are seeing is that it is compliance issues. So if we're looking at agriculture and agri-processed products, it is the SPS regulations of the country of destination, the way you want to sell your product, that are applicable. Does the country have particular domestic regulation related to the use of pesticides or packaging? And this is where, for example, studying some of the developments related to green economy promotion and transition become important because more and more countries are looking at those issues very, very carefully. There are also issues, as I've mentioned, related to labeling, to packaging. Those are technical regulations. We've got to understand what they mean. Will this packaging be acceptable? In some countries, there are regulations about the languages in terms of which you've got to label your product. So, of course, if you're exporting your product to a Lucifone country, it'll have to be in Portuguese. So these are some of the issues which, to be honest, are not always front and center when we have a session discussing a trade agreement and new opportunities. So we need a practical guide to trade under the AFCFDA. But that guide needs to be sector and, in some cases, product specific. Because if you're thinking about trade in poultry, for example, my goodness, there are a lot of very important health regulations that you will have to comply with. So that is so, so important. When it comes to industrial goods, of course, then issues around rules of origin. How do we read the fine print in the rules of origin, for example, what, how do I calculate the value addition? What documentation do I need to prove that that value addition has taken place? Because that's often so, so important. I might be producing products for two different markets, and it may mean I've got to comply with different rules of origin. So I'm going to have to keep my production process separate on the factory floor. So one production line will be focused on market destination A and the other one on market destination B. And I can't confuse them. Agreed. I think that as, simply as you're, wouldn't work. Indeed. I think as, as you're talking now, I'm going to ask the team just to try and see if, if Marie's connection can work for us to cue her back in. And I think as you are talking now, I'm thinking that, um, um, you know, we are thinking particularly around some of the I think as, as we spoke to you about, about the series, we knew that even as we were going through it, uh, some of the topics are going to come out as we unpack some of this. And so I'm so excited that even as you're talking now, there are topics, I think we need a whole session just on, 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 on the real services opportunity on the continent. I think we need a whole session on just trade agreements and how to de demystify them, because I don't know that people know that uh, in terms of understanding some of that. And I think there's so many nuggets that have been dropped today. I mean, we always knew that we needed a session on IP and protecting your company when you move around. I think uh, there was a question on, on the chat around how, how do we get information around this? And I think it certainly will be part of the, of the future sessions that, that, um, that, that we will have. I think we're going to try again just to see if, if Marie is, I can see her, she's on, but I don't know if we can hear her now, Marie. Hi, Lebo, can you hear me? Oh, perfect, thank you, we can hear you <laughs> Great. Thank you much, wonderful, I'm so grateful that you were able to join us even as you were globe trotting and you've made some time to come yes. through. 
we have about 20 minutes left, so I think it would be remiss if we were talking about this agreement and we didn't have a voice from, from the Secretariat, and I'm so glad that you, you're you actually here to, to, to kind of uh, add that voice. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you to give some of your thoughts around some of the topic that we're discussing today, and, and also then just hopefully leave some time at the end for some, for some Q&A. Thank you so much, uh, Marie, heading over to you. Thank you, Lebo. Well, I have to say that uh, speaking after the two panelists is going to be quite the challenge because I'm pretty sure they've given a lot of information already about the agreement, what it seeks to achieve, um, and and what are some of the tools that have been put in place to support implementation, especially to support um, the active, the more meaningful participation of you know SMEs or women-owned businesses, youth-owned businesses um, in the AFCFTA. So I don't exactly, well, I stand guided by you as yeah. to how you would like me to proceed about this. Um, my plan was to really uh, go into details about the agreement, um, talk about its objectives, talk about the, I mean, the scope of the agreement itself and the different tools, and also try to relate these tools um, with, you know, in a practical way, um, I mean, to, to relate yeah. the tools to um, the, the, the activities of, of, you know, businesses out there. And of course, discuss the work that the AFCFTA Secretariat is doing um, on women. So yeah, yeah, I stand guided by you. You might need to yes, advise I, on what you want me to say, uh, what you want me to focus on to save time. Yeah, I, th I think I think probably the latter of what you were speaking about right now. And I think I think for us, I think one of the questions that remains unanswered, and you write some of the some of some of the overview of the agreement, etc., probably is com covered in some extent. But also, I think in the interest of time, I think the biggest focus for us is really around uh, the the role of the secretariat, what the secretariat is doing, and I think a practical guidance in terms of how do the entrepreneurs actually begin to interface, and perhaps even mm -hmm. and perhaps even on some of those tools that you spoke about. We talked. I know that the secret the 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 trade agreement talks very much around uh, youth and women, et cetera, but also just to get a sense in terms of how that is being supported. I think that would be very helpful given the time that we have left. All right. Okay. So um, let's say in a nutshell, I will try to discuss the institutional structure um, of um, that has been set in place, put in place by the um, agreement. Also understand, make, make sure people, um, the participants understand how they can engage um, within that structure. So one of the things that um, you you need to know is that, well, the AFCFTA is a state parties driven um, initiative, um, but the agreement also has put in place an institutional structure that is composed of the Assembly, the Council of Ministers, the Committee of Senior Trade Officials, and the Secretariat. Uh, I don't know if you can still hear me. I'm hoping my, my, my internet will hold. Yes, we can. we can hear you very clearly. We can hear you clearly. So, um, as I said, um, there's a, 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 an institutional structure that was uh, that was established under the agreement. Uh, the assembly is the highest decision-making organ um, of not only the African Union, uh, but also um, of the AFCFTA, and its major role is really to provide um, strategic, uh, provide oversight and strategic, gu strategic guidance on the AFCFTA. It also has exclusive authority to adopt the interpretation of the agreement should that question arise. Now, the Council of Ministers is, is composed, consists of um, ministers responsible for trade. The report, of course, to the Assembly um, through um, the Executive Council of the African Union, which is basically the body that, that brings together the ministers of foreign affairs. Um, and their main role is really to ensure the implementation and enforcement of the agreement. Uh, they are mandated to also take necessary measures for the promotion of the objectives of the agreement, supervise the work of all the committees that are set, in are set up within the agreement and make regulations um, as and when needed, and of course also approve the work plan. And then you have the committee of trade officials, of senior trade officials, sorry, which is made of permanent principal secretaries, 
um, they implement the decisions of the Council of Ministers. They also um, develop the program and action for the implementation of the agreement. They monitor and ensure proper functioning of the AFCFTA. Um, the, the committee also oversees uh, the implementation of the provisions of the agreement and directs the Secretariat to undertake specific um, assignments. Then comes the Secretariat, which is really um, the administrative organ that coordinates the implementation of the AFCFTA itself. It is based in Ghana, Accra. Um, the, His Excellency Wamkele Mene is the first serving Secretary General of, of the, the Secretariat. Um, the Secretariat is, is autonomous. It's an, it's an autom autonomous sorry, institutional body within the AU with, of course, an independent legal personality and it coordinates and provides technical assistance and capacity build, building in trade and trade related issues for the implementation of the agreement but it also engages with key stakeholders such as businesses civil society governments and develop development part partners i'm pretty sure now you're wondering how do you fit in as um you know a, a business or a member of the private sector like i said even if um the afcfta is a state parties led um, um uh, you know it's a state party driven um, institution i mean framework there's still room for the private sector to interact and to engage, and they can engage with the secretariat. The secretariat always organizes consultations, conferences, workshops, and, and trade fairs. Um, I'd like to also mention that the secretariat will be at the Intra-African uh, Trade Fair in Durban uh, next week. Um, and so these are also the, all these platforms. These all these platforms are available for the private sector to engage, um, you know, on the secretariat on issues uh, that are pertinent to them or issues that they wish to be addressed. So it is actually critical to create a strong business, strong business associations and network, and to strategically, um, you know, engage on some of the issues that uh, businesses feel need to be addressed in order to facilitate um, their meaningful participation in trade. But that doesn't stop there of course at the national level it is also possible um for um you know businesses to 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 interact uh, to to engage uh, through their chief negotiators for instance so they they would engage with the relevant ministries in this case it would be the ministry of trade and also discuss with the chief negotiators what are some of the the issues that they'd like to see addressed or um you know uh, some of the issues that they need to uh, they, they would like the, uh, the agreement to, to deal with and, of course, escalate the matter uh, during negotiations. And I also would like to point out that the participation of the private sector is also contemplated within the agreement itself. And it is specifically stated, um, provided for, sorry, in uh, the Annex 5 on non-tariff barriers of the Protocol on Trading Services, which sets in place um, and it's also institu inst institutional structures to ensure that NTBs that are reported uh, within an online system, mechan um, an, an online me reporting mechanism that I'm going to discuss shortly, I addressed not only by the government, but also uh, by the private sector. So one of these institutional structures is the National Monitoring Committee, which is made of um, representatives of the government and of the private sector. And the National Monitoring Committee within the context of NTBs is actually the resolution and the, the, the resolution of NTBs is quite critical because they, uh, the National Monitor, the, the committee itself, um, is actively involved in the resolution of the reported NTBs um, in the sense that they develop, among other things, of course, they develop plans, a matrix of, resolu uh, of resolutions of NTBs, and they interact closely um, with the national focal point to ensure that the, the, the NTB that is reported on the system um, is, 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 done, is done within a reasonably um, you know, short time. So that, that brings me to my next, my next point, which is to discuss some of the tools um, that support the AFCFT, the implementation of the AFCFTA. I'm pretty sure um, the, the previous speakers have all discussed uh, in length the rules of origin. Um, so I'm, I'm, I will not dwell too much into it, and I will focus more um, on, on, some of, on, on one specific tool, which is uh, the non-tariff barriers reporting, monitoring, and eliminating mechanism that was that was established within um, the Annex Five on non-tariff barriers of the Protocol on Trading Goods. Of course, besides that, you also have the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System that basically will allow 
businesses to transact in their in their local currencies it facilitates the convertibility of local currencies this is something that actually presents a, a huge challenge on the continent in the sense that you always need to 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 resort or to to, to use um, you know, foreign currencies um, when when trading, especially when settling um, international transactions or transactions that are, you know, intra-African trade transactions. So the payment and settlement system tries to do away with that hassle. Um, and, and it actually involves um, the, the central banks um, of, of AFC, EFT, state parties. And then we also have um, the, the African Trade Observatory uh, and there's the online negotiations portal. So to go back to the non-tariff barriers online mechanism, like I said, like I mentioned before, it's a mechanism that was established or developed um, to pr provide a platform for the private sector to report in, in real time some of the NTBs or some of the difficulties that they are um, encountering when trying to export or import goods um, within the framework, of course, of the AFCFTA. Uh, I'd like to point out that uh, one of the tenets of, of this uh, mechanism is transparency. And of course, it is free. Um, oh, Lebo, I'm being asked something about me extending my session. Do I, do I click that or you will do that yourself? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So, like I said, um, the, the one of the fundamental, uh, one of the foundations of the, the online mechanism is transparency, and of course, it's made available uh, to everyone. I'd like to point out that it's it's already functional, so it is possible um, for for um, traders to actually report some of the non-tariff barriers that they encounter at borders. And of course, um, just to give you a, a, an understanding of what non-tariff barriers are, they are um, restrictive measures uh, that are imposed by um, by, by governments. I don't know if I'm being heard. Sorry, my internet is, is not quite stable. Great, so non-tariff barriers refer to um, restrictive measures and uh, restrictive regulations, sorry, and procedures that are imposed by government authorities that make importation and exportation of, of products difficult and or costly. It must be pointed out, however, that some of these regulations, like that, those are that related to uh, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, are put in place. Um, sanitary and phytosanitary uh, agricultural products, for instance, are, are put in place for legitimate reasons. But sometimes the NTB occurs in the implementation of the application of that regulation. Either it is it is overly discriminatory, or um, it is it is costly when in reality it shouldn't be. So that that's um, one of the ways in which NTBs occur. So one of them, once if just to give you examples that would um, of NTBs that would be um, you, you, those would include discriminatory taxes, uh, restrictive customs procedures, or prohibitions, quotas, licenses, among other things. So basically, um, how the, mechan the, the mechanism works is that you, you, can, ac you can access it online. Of course, um, the, the Secretariat is working towards making sure that you can also report on your mobile phone. And what happens is that as soon as you, you, you encounter an NTB, for instance, you can go on the system. Um, I, I am going to share the link with you. Uh, trade barriers. Um, it, it's uh, well. The link is tradebarriers.africa. That I'll try to sh to share it in uh, the chat. And um, once you've done that, you have quite a, a number of options. But the one that would be interesting for you would be uh, the option of reporting an NTB. So then the system will take you into some kind of formula or um, a form that you will have to fill and include all the information that is required um, for, um, you know, the, 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 the institution, institutional structures that have been, have been put in place to assess whether or not um, the complaint is, is an NTB. So you don't actually have to be technical. You just explain your, your, your problem in very simple terms. And it is up to uh, the institutions that have been um, established under the annex to assess whether or not this actually qualifies as an NTB. And if it does, then it is allocated um, to uh, the focal point. I'm actually going ahead of myself. So let me explain also about the institution, institutional structures. So at the continental level, you have um, um, an AFCFTA NTB coordination unit. 
Um, and then at the national level, you have the National Monitoring Committee that I spoke about and a focal point. So um, the role of the coordination um, unit is really to coordinate the progressive um, resolution and elimination of NTBs. Um, so at the national level, the two uh, structures that I mentioned, meaning the National Monitoring Committee and the focal point, are very critical when it comes to following up and resolving the NTBs that are being reported. Like I said, the National Monitoring Committee is made of representatives of the private sector and the government, and they sort of oversee um, the, the, you know, the resolution of the NTB uh, in the country in which it, it occurred. And of course, they collaborate with with uh, the country that the the country that complained, or at least yes, the country that has issued the complaint as well, to make sure that everything, if they, they need clarification, then they clarify. Um, if they, they, some processes need to be extended, then they do that. And the system is designed in such a way that they actually can do that in the system. So it doesn't have to be an email. They can actually chat directly as you would, for instance, in Facebook um, or, you know, WhatsApp. So it's, it's real-time resolution of, of uh, the NTB that is encountered. And of course, the, the national focal point um, really coordinates the implementation of the NTB mechanism and also offers secretarial uh, services to the National Monitoring Committee and make sure it does the follow-up uh, with his counterpart in the other country to ensure um, that the NTB is resolved. As for the timing, um, the timeline of resolution, well, it also depends on the complexity of the matter. If it's just a matter of, let's say, making sure that a rule is properly applied, then that can be resolved with reasonably um, within a reasonably short time. But if, for instance, the NTB um, is, is connected, for, for instance, requires the resolution of the NTB itself requires an, a, a legislative process, obviously, you would understand that within that context, it would take slightly longer for the NTB to be uh, resolved. But I would like to also point out that the annex allows um, for provisional measures to be put in place, especially when it comes to perishable goods, because obviously, if the process is going to take longer, um, the trader is not expected, uh, if you, and, and, and it pertains to perishable goods, um, the idea is really to try to minimize the losses um, that the trader would incur um, while the NTB is being resolved. Um, so this is what I'm, I'm, um, my message here would then be to encourage you um, to go through the system, to use it, to, uh, you know, explore the tool. And of course, the Secretariat is ready um, to maybe um, carry out a special training on the tool itself to show you how to use it and, and how to report an NTB on it. But it's available and um, there are already some NTBs that have been reported and um, are undergoing the process of resolution. Uh, right now. Um, so as far as the the agenda, the, the, the AFCFTA and the women agenda is concerned, the agreement does recognize the critical role that women play, um, you know, in intra-African trade. And it's also recognized that women have sort of been marginalized in mainstream trade policy. So the AFCFTA has tried to address that by making sure that one of its general objectives is to promote, um, you know, in sustainable and inclusive um, socioeconomic development and gender equality. And when you even go into more specifics, the Trading Services Protocol actually uh, specifically, um, you know, talks about uh, provide has specific provisions um, that are related. Um, you know, to, to um, yes, women, of course, and SMEs. And I would like to refer to um, Article 27.2 uh, of the protocol, um, which uh, provides for, the, which um, under which actually state parties have agreed to mobilize resources and implement measures with a view to not only improving the, ab the ability of service suppliers to gather information on and to meet regulation and standards, uh, and standards at the international, continental, regional, and national levels, but also to improve the export capacity of both the formal and inform uh, of both formal and informal service suppliers, uh, with particular attention to women and youth, um, and uh, micro small, excuse me, micro small and medium size. Um, service suppliers. Uh, but in addition to that, um, at, um, the, the African leaders have also recognized that specific interventions are required in order to make sure that women can leverage, um, you know, the, the, the opportunities that the AFCFTA offers. And so the AU Assembly of Heads of State and Government 
made a commitment to broaden the inclusiveness in the operation of the agency. Yes, I can hear you.
Well, I can hear you. Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Um, so in terms of interventions, I would say that, um, I mean, the modalities of how these interventions will look like has not yet been decided, but the protocol on women in trade and on women and youth in trade is one of them, right? Um, to create a legal framework, um, or at least uh, try to find a way of, of uh, um, you know, putting it not really creating legal commitments, right? That will ensure that state parties um, um, develop strategies and policies that are very practical, but are also targeted towards um, addressing the, the, the different constraints that women and the youth face, um, you face sorry, when trading on the continent. Um, but of course, um, these, these are not the only interventions. Um, you, they will be publicized as, as they, they, they come on um, or as they are established. So um, this is this is I would say this is an ongoing process for now. But um, one one of the, the immediate ones that I can actually discuss right now is is the protocol itself, or at least yes, or at least the preparatory work towards it. And I'd like to say that um, you know um, one of the things that we're going as a secretariat um, we're going to be doing is is also do additional consultations of all stakeholders because the idea is really to make sure that we capture voices of as many women-led businesses of, of as many stakeholders as possible. Um, your second question was related to, remind me again, sorry. <laughs> My second question was, where, where does the Secretariat see um, the immediate opportunities uh, for, for women owned businesses or for youth you're talking very much about women owned businesses and youth but i know that our previous speakers also had some thoughts around it but if we were to just say you know this is where we see um um some of the opportunities that exist that are the immediate opportunities for women and youth where would you see those well i would say this i mean the afcfta opens up a larger market right which would mean mm -hmm. that um i mean it, it would it would definitely improve the trading services sector with uh, trade, uh, trading services because trading services is actually um has a huge share it is important on the continent um, mm -hmm. So you can either be, you are able then to supply services not only in your national territory, but you can actually take it, you know, in, in other territories uh, in much more simpler conditions. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, um, uh, you also know that sometimes certain goods need services um, in, in, the, in the production process. Um, you know, uh, um, I, would, I would give the example, the example, sorry, for instance, of um, um, you know, you needing uh, a software, for instance, to use, um, you know, I mean, the services that are needed um, to to produce, for instance, the design, energy, um, among other things. Or so you also have services that are needed for the distribution of goods, marketing, transportation, storage services that are needed to use the goods um, or the mm -hmm. product itself, such as softwares and phones. So those are things that. Um, sort of, you know, they open up the market and you, can no, you are no longer confined to just maybe one or two countries. You have a market of 55 countries that you, you can try to, to penetrate and offer those services on. So another thing that I would like also to say is that, well, 
I'm pretty sure there's some there's, there's some SMEs that are producing goods. Of course, subject to the, the com to compliance with rules of origin. Um, I was not here during the entire conversation, but I did hear Trudy mention um, you know the compliance issue. But subject mm -hmm. to that, you are able then to access your goods are able to access the market. And another thing, um, another mm -hmm. side of the coin would be that as a producer, for instance, you are able then to get access to inputs you know, in order to add value to your goods at a much cheaper price, which would mean that you would be, your products would be more competitive on a much larger market because then the demands, when markets open up, the demand for sophisticated goods also increase, which would mean that for you to be able to uh, really leverage the opportunities, you also have to, to make sure that you add value to your goods, you know, to make sure that they are competitive because there would be so other, so many other goods out there um, so you need to distinguish yourself in that way. But that would mean that if you get inputs, for instance, from, from within the continent, that would be cheaper, which means that the production cost will also be reduced. And that, in essence, would make sure that you, pro, you, 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 you are able to offer really good products, but at a very reasonable price, right? And that itself also gives you a lot of returns. So I would say, um, and, and of course, um, um, you know, I think with, with COVID-19, we have appreciated um, the role of digitization, you know, um, in, in, uh, deliver, in, in providing services, for instance. This is not something that can be neglected. And, uh, of course, one of, um, one of the, the, the key issues that will be negotiated within the, the AFC-FTA agreement will also be um, issues related to e-commerce. Um, so, as you can see, that they can also leverage that, you know, to go across borders as well. Um, so, I would say that, that we, I don't necessarily have very practical examples of how you yeah. can do it. But the first stage is really to make sure that um, the women-led businesses and youth-led businesses, you know, MSMEs, have the capacity to import. And one way of improving their capacity is to make sure that they comply with the different rules and regulations that, um, you know, are, are in force, you know, such as the rules of origins, which are very critical because they determine, um, I would say, the economic nationality of your product. If your product does not comply, with the rules of origin, certainly it will not benefit um, from from um, you know the preferences under the AFC FTA. So there's really there's, there's need for huge support in order to to break down you know the rules of origin. To uh, I heard Trudy speak about a practical guide to sort of break down you know how rules of origin work and what is it that is needed for very specific products um, you know to qualify. Um, so I would say that think about it that way, that you have a you have a bigger market, you have a possibility to diversify, you know, your, your products and services that makes you a little bit that, that, that will definitely make you more competitive. That means more revenue. And of course, it trickles down because then you are able to improve your standards of living um, ultimately. So that's that's what I would say for now. OK, wonderful. Thank you. For, thank you for that. Thank you so much. Um, and we've we've gone over uh, time, uh, but I, I, you know, it just goes to prove yet again how expensive this topic is. And in fact, you probably need to kind of revisit it again and unpack it again. Yes. And it's like yes. every every session, every section that you and Trudy and Claudia, unfortunately, we lost uh, due to uh, load shedding thanks to ESCOM. But at least it happened uh, straight after her presentation. But everything that you have talked about is actually something that we could actually have an entire session on uh, that people can engage with and unpack and, and, and talk about. So thank you so much. To, to, to the three of you actually for your time. Uh, thank you for, you know, particularly you after running around and actually still being here, we really appreciate it. I think certainly as Womanomics Africa, we'll be engaging with you a lot more as the Secretariat. I think we're excited as we were talking to you around your journey in terms of making sure that you're getting the voices of women as you're thinking about these, these women in trade protocols. So we are quite, you know, we, we are willing to be there and support that journey with you um, and make sure that we can, we, we can, we can actually um, uh, uh, make that happen. So thank you so much, uh, Marie. Uh, thank you to everybody that's uh, joined us. I'm going to just uh, 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 close off. I know that we had a few questions, but I think we'll try try and find a way to answer those, even if even as, as we're going through. So, ladies and uh, gentlemen, if we had some on, we've come to the end of our session. Uh, you know, when we first thought this, we thought three hours would be a long time, but three hours has gone off just like that. And now we're at the end of our session. Uh, there were some questions that we didn't quite get to. We will make sure that we answer those as we uh, 
engage with our post event uh, communication. Uh, we invite you once again to make sure that you are subscribed to the series because we're going to have a whole lot of, 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 of sessions following this just to unpack some of the sessions that we had today. Thank you so much to, 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 to Trudy, who really, uh, I think, gave us an overview of the AFCTA, but also gave us a very practical perspective of what it looks like and 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 what are some of the considerations as 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 we as 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 women are looking to trade? We had um, uh, Claudia who spoke from a South African perspective. So, what is South Africa prioritizing? Where are some of the areas? What are some of the support that the DTI is offering? Where are some of the areas that work is currently being done and is also going to be done in order to make sure that they support women and some of the incentives that are in place. There is also uh, we also had a conversation uh, right now with Marie, and I, I know that it was a bit quick, but I think she gave us a good insight into the Secretariat, what it does, how it is set up, and most importantly, how entrepreneurs can engage with them, and also some of the incentives, I think, that are in place to make sure, once again, that the women and the youth are not just left in the preamble, but actually there is concerted effort to make sure that they are brought along as part of this journey of making sure that women can trade. So I want to thank all our speakers for their generous time. I know that uh, we had some presentations, particularly from Trudy and, and Claudia. We will make those available to everybody that attended today. I think we'll probably put them on our website. That's probably easier. We also would also appreciate some of your feedback around uh, the session today. So we will send out a questionnaire over the next couple of days just to give, give your thoughts on what you thought about the session today, but most importantly, what you'd like to see going forward, because I think that would be also very important for us. And, and, and so that we can make sure that we tailor these sessions to what is actually the, the, the real information that is needed and what will be useful to you. I think Rehema and I always talk about the fact that when, when we do gather, when we do put women together in a room, when we do have sessions, we want to make sure that they are catalytic in nature, which means really when you you, you are better off having come into the session. So the, so the level that came into the session is, 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 is different from the level that, left, that leaves the session because there's so much value that has been added. That's so much value that has been added uh, to, to what has been shared. I'm pretty sure that we'll be seeing Trudy, Claudia, and, and Marie again in these sessions, because as I said, there is so much more that can be shared, but we're also looking forward to unpacking new topics for you with really, really the biggest, biggest objective and the biggest outcome that we want is that you are able to participate more meaningfully in the areas that are driving growth on the continent, which means women are actually able to put money in their pocket. And we can start seeing how they are not just contributing to GDP, but also able to receipt what the GDP is, is, is producing into their pockets. So thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for staying the time. Please look out for more communication about the next session that we're going to have. I think we've got it scheduled for December before everybody goes off. But we're also having more sessions also in the new year. Wishing you a wonderful, wonderful uh, Friday Eve, Puza Thursday, as it is in Joburg, for those that do Puza. So you've got some time for that. And also a, a successful remainder of the week and a wonderful weekend. Thank you, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening to those that are on. Good night.